Welcome everyone. Uh, if I can invite you to take a seat. Uh, bienvenue à tous. Est-ce que je peux vous inviter à prendre place? Nous allons commencer bientôt. Uh, donc c'est notre grand plaisir uh, de vous accueillir aujourd'hui. C'est la 18e édition de ce Forum Afrique. So uh, this is the uh, 18th edition of the Africa Forum. It's organized by the OECD Development Center and the African Union. We're extremely proud. Uh, we're in partnership with Agence Française de Développement. Uh, together with uh, IRD, Mashav, Afro Champions Initiative, and Uber. Donc, uh, nos partenaires cette année sont l'Agence Française de Développement, l'IRD, Mashav, et l'Afro Champions Initiative. Alors, um, to this year's title, you can see, is uh, Africa's Shifting Boundaries. So, we will focus on the latest development dynamics. And if you want to know everything, even beyond what we will discuss, This is where you will find it. So this is the very first of its kind. We have uh, published it with the uh, African Union. Uh, we're extremely proud. Um, so what will we discuss today? Today we will discuss the promise of regional integration. You know, there's been this uh, uh, re continental free trade agreement that's been signed, which is a massive, uh, it's a massive advancement. It's a landmark. We will discuss the relationship between migration and development and the global contribution of the continent uh, beyond economics, so the, uh, how humanities feature in the picture, and the way forward, uh, what do we need to do to foster continental unity. Donc cette année, le Forum Afrique uh, va se focaliser sur des contours en mouvement. Uh, nous allons examiner les dernières dynamiques du développement. Vous allez pouvoir trouver cette publication à l'entrée. Nous sommes extrêmement fiers euh, de l'avoir euh, coproduite avec l'Union africaine. Euh, et je salue M. Kwasi qui est en train de nous rejoindre. Euh, de quoi allons-nous parler aujourd'hui Nous allons parler des promesses de l'intégration régionale, euh, parce que euh, cette intégration régionale va permettre une croissance inclusive et davantage d'emplois durables. Nous allons parler de la relation entre migration et développement, notamment euh, certains mythes euh, et le, le fait que cette migration n'est pas une menace. Euh, nous allons parler également de ce que l'Afrique apporte au monde, euh, donc de la, de la perspective sociale au-delà des considérations économiques, et enfin de comment aller de l'avant des politiques qui seront nécessaires pour consolider cette, Af cette Afrique unie et euh, avec une meilleure intégration entre les pays. Uh, now some housekeeping announcements. So, uh, you should use Twitter. You can and use Twitter. The hashtag is Africa Forum, all in one word. Donc, vous pouvez utiliser Twitter. Le hashtag est Africa Forum, en un seul mot. Uh, you have a Wisembly link, so look at your program. This is a way for you to interact and ask questions, which will be conveyed to the moderators. Uh, there's also simultaneous interpretation. You can find headsets in the pocket right next to your seat. So, uh, we will be um, interpreting uh, into French and English. Um, This morning, there will be no break. Uh, we will break for lunch, so we will kindly ask you to remain seated, or if you would like coffee, we'll be served outside, but please do that so that it doesn't disturb the session. Donc ce matin, nous, nous allons euh, avoir les discussions en continu jusqu'à midi. Du café sera servi dehors, mais s'il vous plaît, essayez de le faire discrètement pour que euh, nos panélistes puissent continuer leurs interventions. Euh, nous allons bientôt accueillir nous allons bientôt accueillir nos participants de la séance d'ouverture. Euh, donc, je vous demanderai également d'éteindre vos téléphones portables euh, afin qu'ils ne perturbent pas le déroulement de la séance. We're, we're going to start shortly. If I can ask you to uh, turn your cell phones off or to put them on mute so that uh, speakers can actually uh, hear themselves speak. Uh, that would be wonderful. Thank you very much. And uh, please stay tuned. Uh, we're about to start.
Ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to please take your seat. Uh, thank you very much for your patience. Uh, allow us to um, welcome um, Angel Gurria, Secretary General of the OECD, uh, President Nana Akufo Addo, uh, President of the Republic of Ghana, and Victor Harrison, Commissioner for Economic Affairs, African Union Commission. Mesdames et Messieurs, si vous voulez bien accueillir le secrétaire général de l'OCDE, M. Angel Gurria, le président Nana Akufo-Addo de la République du Ghana, et Victor Harrison, commissaire aux affaires économiques de la Commission de l'Union africaine.
Um, as you prefer. So, yes, ladies and gentlemen, it is uh, our great honor to have this, uh, this, this distinguished guest with us. And um, I will shortly call our Secretary General, uh, Angel Gurria, uh, to come and uh, deliver uh, the welcoming remarks of this uh, 18th edition of the Africa Forum, organized by the OECD Development Center and the African Union. Mr. Secretary General. Very good. We have the, we have the okay, same reading. So you keep this one, and I you take this one. <coughs> Here. Mr. President, <coughs> Commissioner, Ministers, uh, Ambassadors, Excellencies. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. President, delighted to have you here. Great honor to have you back. Eh? Wonderful, wonderful surprise. So he, he came over, he came all the way over just to shake hands with you, right there, roll out the red carpet. I'm delighted to open the 18th International Economic Forum in Africa and honored to welcome so many distinguished leaders from Africa. After 18 years, this forum is an institution that remains relevant with its finger on the pulse of the continent. I'd like to thank our co-organizer, the African Union, Victor Harrison, and our forum partners, l'Agence Francaise de Développement, uh, MASHAV, which is uh, Israel's Agency for International Development Cooperation, L'Institut de Recherche pour le Développement, Afro Champions, and Uber. What we will be focusing on today is precisely how we can design the policies which will lead to inclusion and ensure that everyone, families, farmers, and businesses, reaps the benefits of Africa's integration. Now let me begin with the good news. In March this year, African leaders agreed on a historic decision to create the African continental free trade areas. Now, 49 African countries have signed on so far. And as soon as 22 parliaments ratify it, the one Africa market will become the world's biggest free trade area with a population of 1.2 billion people and over $3 trillion in GDP. A great achievement indeed. Moreover, 32 countries have so far signed the protocol to the treaty establishing the African Economic Community relating to the free movement of persons, right of residence, and right of establishment. Now, while migration is often a force of disruption for many countries, this protocol on free movement signals the political confidence and the willingness throughout Africa to cooperate in this crucial area. The better management of migration is therefore of the utmost importance. We have to turn migration into a pillar for development. And when we're talking about integration, Mr. President, I remember in my younger days when uh, I learned everything and I actually wrote a paper about the integration of East Africa uh, on the kind of the other corner um, of the continent when um, uh, Tanzania and uh, Nigeria and Kenya um, and they had a you know, common currency, they had a central bank. So now this was, 
I don't know, I'm a little bit embarrassed to say, but it was over 40 years ago. Um, I was very precocious, Mr. President. Uh, but the question is that already you could see then these efforts of integration. Then for political reasons and other reasons, this broke, broke apart and then didn't, didn't go further. But already you could see that there was these efforts in order to uh, integrate at least regionally and make progress on having this one market concept. Over the past 15 years, Africa's GDP has tripled, making it the world's second fastest growing region with an annual average of 4.6%. Now, just it's still behind Asia, but you're catching up very fast. Following a sharp slowdown in 2016, Africa's growth is bouncing back, with this year's growth reaching 3.7% and expected to reach 4% annually between 2018 and 2020. Consumption growth is also expected to drive this process thanks to strong population growth, urbanization, and the higher purchasing power of an emerging African middle class. Actually, Laurent Bossard uh, just uh, uh, announced to the president that uh, very soon he will have available a, an analysis on the urbanization of Africa where he is mapping every um, population center of more than 10,000 inhabitants and therefore uh, capturing this very, very fast process of urbanization going on in the continent and all its consequences. In addition, African countries have diversified their trade partnerships. Between 2000 and 2016, Africa tripled its trade with the rest of the world. It went from 276 billion to uh, more than 800 billion, with trade flows shifting from traditional to emerging partners like China and India. And last but not least, we've long recognized the great potential and the benefits of African unity. Fully liberalizing trade in goods, for example, could boost Africa's GDP by 1% and total employment by 1.2%. Intra-African trade could grow by 33%. You don't, so just fully liberalizing trade in goods could boost Africa's GDP by 1%, Total employment by 1.2% and inter-African trade could grow by 33%. And of course, Africa's total trade deficit could be halved. So you see the power, the potential of the numbers um, and uh, of, of this integration, of this unity. Despite these positive achievements, however, Challenges persist. Although growth has increased, it has not sufficiently reduced poverty, nor improved social inclusion and well-being. So we must focus on achieving more inclusive growth. Today, while extreme poverty has declined proportionally, 395 million Africans, almost 400 million Africans are still affected by it. And evidence shows that in the future, poverty will increasingly be concentrated in the African continent because that's where the population growth mostly will be happening. In addition, 282 million workers are vulnerably employed. With men, men and youth affected the most in this precarious or vulnerable employment. Only 12% of African women are on wage paying employment. That's compared to 22% in Asia and one third in Latin America and the Caribbean. So only 12% of African women are on wage paying employment. About 42% of Africa's working youth 
live on less than $1.90 a day. And it is estimated that by 2050, Africa will be home to one in four people on Earth, while its working age population is expected to increase by almost, you know, by, by, by almost one billion, that means 902 million. This is a very, very great challenge, how to take, how to deal with these huge numbers. This is just enormous growth. In this respect, growth that creates quality jobs is key to the continent's social cohesion. As I stressed at yesterday's MNET, this is the uh, network of uh, enterprises that are engaged with Africa, um, investing in infrastructure, helping laggard regions to grow, and enabling vulnerable people to accumulate productive assets are all critical in supporting inclusive growth. African governments must support the ongoing process of structural transformation through policies to boost investment, to close the infrastructure gaps, strengthen the domestic private sectors, diversify production, diversify exports, and deepen regional integration. Now, inclusive growth, quality jobs in Africa, they also influence population movements. Data can help rationalize political discussions. The president was saying data, data, data as an element that will, of course, allow us to manage the situation better. He's the focus on working on something which is not very sexy, which is not ter tremendously attractive, will not generate you know, headlines in the newspapers, but having full control of what's going on with our own countries makes it possible to deal better with the challenges arising in our own countries. Then, in absolute terms, uh, you know, this question of, uh, you know, movement of people, population, migration issues, uh, sometimes can become pretty contentious. In absolute terms, Africa is only the fourth continent of origin of international migration. Actually, Asia is first with 106 million. Then uh, Europe, 61 million. Latin America and the Caribbean, 38 million. And then comes Africa with 36 million international migrants in 2017. But of course, the impression, the perception is that the numbers are much larger. So the amount of remittances, transfers of know-how, trade networks across borders indicate that the migration development nexus can actually be productive. These correlations need to be better studied to offer policies that are fit for purpose. Now, Mr. President, ministers, ambassadors, dear friends, Monsieur le Président, the OECD has been working with Africa for many years. With nine African countries currently members of the OECD Development Center, here we have the head of the Development Center and the chairwoman of the uh, Development Center, and with work underway across the house with institutions like the African Union Commission the African Development Bank, NEPAD, which I understand from Victor Harrison is now, where's Victor? Oh, there he is. Uh, uh, always at the podium. Huh? Yeah. Uh, but I know that, that uh, there's an integration process with NEPAD uh, going on with the, with the African Union, which is a very, very welcome development because there's a fragmentation of many of these institutions. And now, in here, Mr. Masservisi is uh, smiling with great uh, satisfaction about that development, and we, we share that, that satisfaction. And of course, the Sahel and West Africa Club, Monsieur Bossard. How long has it been that the club was established? 44. 44 years. So you see a, uh, a very well-established institution working for that particular region. 
We're ready to further support solutions for inclusive, broad-based, sustainable development. Now, let me um, mention some of the strands of work that we would propose to you. All this, uh, at this year's MCM, the MCM is the Ministerial Council meeting that we held uh, at the end of May. Our ministers received a roadmap for advancing the OECD's engagement with Africa by looking at domestic resource mobilization, the investment environment, competitiveness, structural transformation, migration, education, and as I said, statistical systems. We've been collaborating with the African Union to co-produce knowledge on socio-economic and institutional matters through the first edition of the Africa's Development Dynamics Report. After having co-produced 17 annual editions of the African Economic Outlook with the partnership of the African Development Bank and always supported by the very generous, you know, European Commission and, um, that supports 17 years producing the African Economic Outlook. And now we have, have this partnership with the African Union um, that produces Africa's development economics. This one is about growth, jobs, and inequalities. And of course, every year there is a new, a new title, a new issue uh, that is being uh, produced and focused on. Now, there's also been working on fiscal issues. Now, I was telling the president, I said, Mr. President, this may not be a bestseller. This is not tremendously sexy as a title. When you say revenue statistics in Africa, not everybody rushes to get a copy, you know. However, every practitioner that has to do with this rushes to get a copy because this is the first time that we're generating this kind of material and that this material is being generated, period. We started doing this with uh, Latin America. We started doing this then with Africa. Now the Asian countries have asked us to do this. And uh, I can tell you what happens is having been myself a minister of finance, this is the kind of thing that will move you into action when it comes to revenue enhancing actions or policy decisions. I um, was sharing with the president the experience we had in Accra when Trevor Manuel, well known to many of you, suddenly said, how do you spell aid? And everybody thought it was a really silly question, you know, how do you spell aid? Well, A-I-D. And then he said, T-A-X, T-A-X. And then everybody kind of stood up and said, T-A-X, it was a, a sort of a, uh, well, it gives you an idea that the question of you know, re domestic resource mobilization uh, is an issue whose time had come. And then of course, as the president shared with us, we've been working on that since. And of course, it becomes quite critical. Do you start with mobilizing resources first domestically, and then, of course, that makes it easier to mobilize or to call in resources uh, from the outside world. Now, uh, we've also been working on um, things like um, uh, the OECD, the SWAC. SWAC is the South, you know, the, the uh, West Africa Club, the Sahel and West Africa Club. It's called Africapolis. And Outside, as you were coming down the stairs, there are some chairs in there that are going to be, you know, there's going to be a presentation. And this is, as I said before, it's about every population center of above, what is it, uh, Laurent, 10,000, uh, is going to be mapped there, and there's going to be a register there. Um, it's, a, it's a database on African cities, and uh, we're going to officially launch it during the AfriCity Summit in Marrakesh on the 22nd of November, allowing users to explore a wide range of population 
and geospatial data on African cities, which are comparable across countries and across time, in order to extract the proper conclusions, in order to propose the proper policies um, for best practices. In addition, our latest data show that net bilateral ODA flows from the DAC countries, the donor countries, to least developed countries, most of which are in Africa, increased by 4% in real terms in 2017. This is very good news, not because 4% is an extraordinarily high number, but because it reverted to the trend. It was coming down. So it's good to know that even if modestly, but you are changing the trend. We're also driving the use of blended finance, which is basically you know, public, private. Um, between 2012 and 2015, official development finance unlocked 81 billion in private finance for development globally. Of that amount, about 55 billion went to LDCs, most of it to Africa. In addition, the OECD is supporting work in the context of the Africa Advisory Group, focused on domestic resource mobilization and tax. Despite substantial progress since 2000, taxes represent, on average, only around 19% of GDP in 16 African countries that we covered in the uh, revenue statistics in Africa of 2018, compared to about 23% in Latin America. Now, I don't want to say the number of how much tax represents in the countries of the OECD or even in Paris, you know, in, in France, uh, because they're close to uh, 50%. And we're not recommending, uh, Mr. Matsavici will correct me or support me, but uh, not necessarily recommending that you go that high, but certainly, Mr. President, between 19 and 50, there's a big, big gap, and one can move up that stairs, up that ladder, in order to make it possible for the respective governments to deliver the necessary services, provided they have the wherewithal without incurring in debt. Now, through the OECD, UNDP, I was telling you about the tax inspectors without borders. I was telling the president there, imagine that your audit teams are sitting in there with a multinational company. And they've been sitting there with a multinational company several times, but this time there's a new person there in the team on the audit side, on the government side. And this is one of the world's greatest experts on the particular area of expertise of the company involved. And they will be looking at the numbers and the financial statements, and they will say, well, my dear, the party's over. You know, basically, you've been having a picnic, but right now, you have to start paying because of this, and because of that, because of that, because of that. So they know their interlocutors very well, but they also know the sector. And then, let me just tell you with great pride, We've spent a few hundred thousand in paying for tickets and paying for people to go there, lodgings, etc. We've gotten so far, just for Africa, about 414 million in terms of additional revenue. It's one of the greatest, best, you know, cost benefit exercises. Why? Because the companies understand. They say, I did my best. I tried for as long as I could to legally, or not sometimes not so legally, avoid the taxation. You know, now I know the time has come. We start paying, and that's very good news. And it's one of the things that come out of these tax, the, the tax work we're doing. We're also working um, with the African Development Bank, the Inter-American, the Intergovernmental Action Group Against Money Laundering in West Africa. As I said, NEPA, the World Bank to study the negative impact of illicit financial flows. Let me tell you how big they are. They exceed, they exceed 
the amount of ODA provided to Africa. This is very dramatic indeed. Um, well, you can imagine the impact that that has on the continent's progress towards development goals. And we're conducting country-specific programs. This includes our close engagement with our key partners, South Africa, in our multidimensional country reviews with Ivory Coast, with Senegal, with Morocco, uh, among others. Um, I, I was saying, Mr. President, that uh, the illegal flows, the money flows, you know, the, the um, actually um, exceed the amount of ODA that is provided to Africa. So that, you know, the big threat, the big, the big implication. Last but not least, regarding our work in the context of international fora, the OECD provides support to the G20 compact with Africa. The president just came back from Berlin, precisely from uh, uh, speaking to German authorities about the compact for Africa, where Ghana is, a, is one of the players. Um, and we've been working on reform in several countries, Cote d'Ivoire, Egypt, Morocco, Senegal, Tunisia, to promote private investment. There's also the Deauville Partnership, where we've been providing hands-on policy advice in Egypt, even in Libya. I mean, you wouldn't believe it. We just produced a book called SMEs in Libya for the post-conflict period to show clearly that there is a future, that there's tomorrow, that one should plan for whenever the hostilities abate. Morocco, Tunisia, etc. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. President, this year with the passing of Kofi Annan, we lost one of the world's most inspirational fighters for multilateralism, for openness, for cooperation. We were privileged to host him several times here at the OECD and as a guest of honor at the 2015 Africa Forum. I can think of no no more appropriate tribute to Secretary General Annan's legacy than to support the development of Africa going forward. And in the person today of the President of Ghana. Today's forum gives us the opportunity to continue working together and to design, to develop, and to deliver better policies for better lives in Africa. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary General. Merci, Monsieur le Secretary General. C'est maintenant mon, notre grand plaisir uh, d'accueillir Monsieur le Commissaire Victor Harrison uh, pour ses remarques introductives. Monsieur le Commissaire, s'il vous plaît. Um, please uh, allow us to welcome Commissioner Victor Harrison, our partner uh, from the African Union Commission. Monsieur le Commissaire. Son Excellence, Monsieur le Président de la République du Ghana, Excellence, Mesdames et Messieurs les Ambassadeurs, Mesdames et Messieurs les ministres, Monsieur le secrétaire général de l'OCDE, Monsieur le directeur du Centre de développement de l'OCDE, distingués participants, Mesdames et Messieurs. Au nom de Son Excellence, Dr Moussa Faki Mahamat, président de la Commission de l'Union africaine, je voudrais remercier notre hôte L'OCDE, je voudrais remercier notre hôte, l'OCDE, qui organise annuellement un forum sur l'Afrique, qui, l'Afrique, est le berceau et l'avenir de l'humanité. Le thème du forum de cette année, Afrique des contours 
en mouvement. Ce thème m'a même apporté de la réflexion en premier lieu sur le terme contour ou frontière. La délimitation géographique de l'Afrique est caractérisée par les différents océans et mers. Au nord, par la mer Méditerranée, au nord-est, par la mer Rouge et la mer d'Arabie, à l'ouest, par l'océan Atlantique et enfin à l'est, par l'océan Indien. Voici délimité un contour, une frontière naturelle de l'Afrique. Pourtant, dans le cours de l'histoire, les colonisateurs, à partir des critères politico-économiques, ont construit à leur gré des frontières, divisant entre autres des familles. Voici des frontières fabriquées de toutes pièces pour diviser l'Afrique. De cet aperçu géo-historique, la mondialisation, un phénomène socio-économique, n'amène-t-elle pas à l'évanescence des frontières du moins commerciales Ceci m'amène à vous rappeler l'essence de l'Union africaine et son agenda 2063. Pour une Afrique unie et solidaire parlant d'une seule voix. L'acte constitutif de l'Union africaine vise à accélérer, à promouvoir, à renforcer l'efficacité et le processus d'intégration du continent. En effet, cet engagement en faveur de l'intégration fait partie intégrante de la vision ayant conduit à la création de l'Organisation de l'Unité africaine en 1963 et celle de l'Union africaine en 2002. Dans le processus d'intégration dont l'objectif ultime est l'union économique et monétaire avec des politiques économiques communes, tous les pays africains ont signé l'intégration régionale à travers les huit communautés économiques régionales d'Afrique. Bien qu'il soit admis que les degrés d'intégration à une communauté économique régionale varie d'un État membre à un autre, il demeure que l'avenir de l'Afrique se trouve dans l'intégration régionale à travers laquelle elle pourra élargir les marchés nationaux en termes de débouchés et trouver des complémentaires en termes d'approvisionnement ainsi que de la solidarité. Bref, ce sera l'occasion de faire preuve de panafricanisme économique. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the recent adoption of the agreement establishing the African Continental Free Trade Area and the protocol of the free movement of persons, as well as the launch of a single African air transport market by African aid of state and government reiterate the commitment to achieve the political and economic integration of the continent. Africa's integration agenda is also driven by the objectives, among others, to one, to establish the necessary conditions which enable the continent to play its right, rightful role in the global economy and in international negotiation. Two, to promote cooperation in all fields, 
on human activity to raise the living standard of African people and research in all fields, in particular in science and technology. For different topics that will be discussed during this forum will help to deepen the issues that are no fundamental to Africa and then provide solutions since the African population aspires to rapid and sustainable development. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Africa has demonstrated determination to take its destiny into its own hands by experimenting in precedented strong economic growth rates. However, this growth will resilient remains fragile, non-inclusive, and jobless, with a slight reduction in inequality and poverty. Of 12 million young people join the African workforce each year, only 4 million find formal employment. And about 60% of jobs in Africa are considered vulnerable. This socioeconomic situation leads us to face major challenges in achieving the Africa you want, including those of a sustainable and inclusive growth. It's worth recording that Africa has more 60% of all fertile but unused land. 12% of all oil reserve. 40% of all gold, gold, etc. However, the African market remains flooded with manufactured goods from elsewhere. Africa spent $35 billion on imported food products in 2015, with a projected increase of 110 billion by 2025. Despite preferential conditions of access to several economics zones markets, Africa produces few processed goods that it could export. From 2010 to 2015, manufacturing goods accounting for only 18% of Africa's exports and Africa's share of global manufacturing export remains below 1%. Only. The time to, the, to transform its economies has come for Africa. The continent must process its raw materials from industrialization. Moreover, within a context of a di digitalization era and first competition, Africa must build modern and competitive industries. Hence, the, industry, the introduction of digital tools and interconnected robots that will change our working, our producing, and our learning habits. In this regard, 
the continental free trade area will open new opportunities for the African private sector, foreign investment, and inter-entrepreneurial enterprise transaction with an aggregate market of 1.2 billion people in 2017, and an estimate continent's middle class of 1.1 billion people by 2060. Her opportunities make Africa more attractive. Priority, priority is being given to the improvement of business climate by many African countries. According to the doing business last year, Sub-Saharan Africa is the region with the highest number of reforms. In addition, regional demand for goods is green, growing and the technology to produce them is coming more accessible. Effective implementation for Africa's integration agenda requires accompanying measures, including infrastructure and energy development, human resource, financial institution, agricultural development, etc. On this note, the African Union has developed various initiatives, such as the Program for, the, for Infrastructure Development in Africa, PIDA, the Action Plan for Accelerating Industrial Development of Africa, AIDA, the Comprehensive African Agriculture Development Program, CADEP, the Pan-African University, the Pan-African Financial Institution, including the African Investment Bank, the African Monetary Fund, the Pan-African Value Exchange, and the African Central Bank. This open up investment opportunities in PPP, infrastructure, construction, finance, and logistics, among others. Africa infrastructure investment needs alone will be in the range of 130 billion dollar per year. In the same vein, the young foreign support to Africa in peace, security, and human rights. I invite foreign SMEs to invest in Africa as these actions uh, will have more impact on transformation, employment, and growth in a context of co-production, co-production for Dr. Kwasi, and increase of a private sector involvement, the African Union Commission launched the Continental Business Network, isn't it, my dear Mayaki? <laughs> and other platforms that aim to crowd in a financing and a support the structural projects by creating a network between the public and private sectors. The development of various industries in Africa will provide jobs for Africa's growing youth and thereby help to reduce persistent unemployment and therefore curb migration. On the topic of migration, it is well known that the human settlement has been done through successive waves of migration for African continent. The reality of today is that the main drivers of this displacement include conflict, violence, environmental change and lack of employment opportunities 
which in some case have exacerbated food insecurity issues. However, I would like to draw your attention to the fact that more Africans migrate to Africa than to Western Europe. For example, it is estimated that 1.5 million Burkinabi live in Côte d'Ivoire. As Africans, the first lever we can act on is the free movement of people coupled with the free movement of goods and capital. Excellence. Comment? Merci, merci. Merci. Je sais que je vais dépasser mon temps et je vais m'arrêter. Merci. Monsieur le secrétaire général a parlé tantôt, parce qu'il m'a parlé en français, je vais continuer en français. Monsieur le secrétaire général a, tenté, a parlé tantôt de rapports sur les dynamiques de développement en Afrique. Nous sommes en train de préparer le deuxième rapport. Et j'espère que l'année prochaine, on fera ici la présentation donc, du deuxième rapport. Excellences, mesdames et messieurs, j'espère que ce forum continuera d'être une plateforme de coopération fluctueuse entre l'Union africaine et l'OCDE, servant de creuser pour la conception d'idées novatrices et de recommandations pratiques pour le développement de mon continent, de notre continent africain. Enfin, je vous souhaite à tous de fructueuses discussions qui mèneront à des solutions panafricaines à la hauteur des défis qui attendent le berceau de l'humanité et le marché futur qu'est le continent africain. Je vous remercie de votre aimable attention. Merci, Monsieur le Commissaire. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner Harrison. It is now um, our great honor um, to uh, welcome uh, the President of Ghana uh, for him to deliver his keynote speech. Uh, ladies and gentlemen. Secretary General of the OECD, former President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Ghana's Minister for Foreign Affairs, the AU Commissioner for Economic Affairs, the EU Commissioner for Development Cooperation, Ghana's Ambassador to France, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I thank the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development OECD for the opportunity to be part of this prestigious event, which is being held in a city I know well and love. I spent some five years here in the early 1970s, working as a young lawyer with a then renowned American international law firm, Coudet Frere, at its offices on the Champs Elysees. My, present, my presence in this city obviously brings back nostalgic memories, which makes me very pleased to be in Paris again. The theme for this forum, Africa's Shifting Boundaries, which will, quote, scrutinize the key topics of growth, employment, migration, and development in the wake of Africa's historical decision 
for closer integration, unquote, is exactly what I've been advocating and fighting for my adult life, especially since becoming the president of the Republic of Ghana some 21 months ago. I believe those of us gathered here in this room are agreed that it is in the mutual interest of African and OECD countries to forge a relationship that will guarantee shared prosperity for us all. For several decades, Africa's economic relationship with OECD countries, particularly those from Europe, has been based primarily on the export of unprocessed raw materials from Africa and the importation of manufactured products and technologically advanced services. Unsurprisingly, the economies of Africa, built on this type of exchange, have been unable to provide decent standards of living for their people. A second strand of the Africa OECD economic relationship has been structured around OECD countries providing aid, ostensibly to help lift Africans out of poverty. Well-intentioned as it is, it has not achieved this goal, nor has it been healthy for the giver or the receiver. Africa needs to develop the capability to produce efficiently a wide array of modern products and services and to trade competitively with OECD countries in finished products. This is the most effective way to transform our economies generate employment and prosperity for our people, and as a byproduct, halt the tragic specter of African youth moving out of the continent, braving horrifying odds in search of the mirage of better living in Europe and the Americas amongst people who are not welcoming of them. The fundamental responsibility for this change rests with us Africans. We can, and should build economies in Africa that are globally competitive and whose principal modes of engagement with other countries are through trade, investment, and political cooperation as equal partners. Inasmuch as Africans need to move away from the mindset of dependence and aid, OECD countries likewise must abandon the mentality of charity to the poor Africans that has tended to shape their relations with Africa. The strategic cooperation for long-term mutual benefit, that saw the United States of America through the Marshall Prayer, guarantee investments by private US firms into Europe and Japan after the Second World War, is a case in point. This cooperation not only helped Europe and Japan rebuild their economy, but also enable them to become viable partners in the international trade and, inter and investment network, with ushered in prosperity amongst them to levels never before experienced in their history. The United States was more than amply repaid for its assistance as it benefits significantly from the rising prosperity. The prospects and conditions clearly exist for the OECD to emulate this example. The time has come for the OECD in Africa to establish a relationship based on investment and trade cooperation. Why do I say so? For four reasons. Firstly, Africa is rich in many natural resources that could form the base for processing industries and allied downstream manufacturing industries. The continent According to the report of the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, UNECA, Eighth African Development Forum, ranks first or second in the world's reserves of bauxite, chromite, cobalt, industrial diamonds, lithium, manganese, phosphate rock, platinum group metals, soda ash, uranium, vermiculite, and zirconium. Africa is also becoming an important player in the world production of coal, 
oil, and gas. That most of these resources are exported in their raw form. Secondly, Africa has an abundance of land. She possesses over half of the world's uncultivated arable land. Yet agricultural production and yields remain low. The continent, unfortunately, has become a net importer of food, with imports of food estimated at some 55 billion United States dollars in 2016, according to the Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO. And what agricultural exports we have are mostly in the raw form. Sustained investment in Africa's agriculture, emphasizing the application of technology, especially digital technology, could yield enormous benefits for the African and global economy in the provision of foodstuffs and diversified agro-based economic activities. Thirdly, a key asset on the continent is its youthful and growing labor force. The UN projects that by 2050, Africa's working population will be about a quarter of the world's population and a third of the world's youth population, that is between the ages of 15 to 24 years, will be in Africa, larger than the combined total of 27% in China and India. In terms of the working age population, that is between 15 and 49 years, Africa's share of 29% in 2050 is expected to be about the same as the combined total of China and India. The empowerment of this young population with access to education and skills training constitutes a very powerful tool for economic development in Africa and the world. Fourthly, Africa is potentially a very important market for OECD countries. In 2017, imports into Africa amounted to 40, 446 billion United States dollars, of which 166 billion United States dollars were from the EU, Japan, and the United States. Africa's population, also 1.2 billion, is expected to increase to 2 billion in 20 years. Exploitation of this market should be in the mutual interest of OECD countries and African countries. As a result of industrialization, and the structural transformation of African economy, African e countries will become more involved in the high end of the international value chain, trading in both final and intermediate manufacturing products. Under these assumptions, by 2030, we could be talking of an African imports market of almost three trillion United States dollars. This is a huge market that exporters in OECD countries could compete for with significant potential employment and income impacts in those countries. So there are tremendous opportunities for shared prosperity for OECD and Africa's countries in Africa's rapid economic growth and transformation. On our own, we in Africa are already beginning to chart a new path Across the continent, macroeconomic management has improved, has improved considerably in recent years. With inflation rates in most countries below 10%, and with the average rate for the region expected to be at or below 10% in the next few years, according to a 28 International Monetary Fund report. We're striving to enhance rapidly domestic resource mobilization through reforms in public revenue policy and administration, and by strengthening our financial sectors to raise domestic private savings. We are making good progress in strengthening the environment for private business, including tackling corruption and excessive bureaucratic procedures. Sub-Saharan Africa features strongly among the regions with the highest share of reforming economies in the World Bank 2018 Doing Business Report. It is no wonder that this year, six of the world's fastest growing economies, including Ghana's, will be in Africa, according to the IMF.
despite the positive outlook, the perception still lingers that Africa is a continent marked by wars, famine, macroeconomic mismanagement, corruption, and red tape that stifles businesses. For us, this clearly means we have to do a better job of marketing the prospects of our continent. And equally important, we have to continue with and deepen the reforms that will attract the requisite investment into the continent. We have set our, heights, our sights higher. And to our friends in the OECD, I urge you to join us in building a continent of prosperity with equal opportunities for all. To this end, I re request four things of the OECD. One, focus your support on growth-enhancing interventions, particularly infrastructure and skills development. According to the African Development Bank, ADB, Africa's infrastructure needs amount to some 170 billion United States dollars a year, with a financing gap of some 108 billion United States dollars. Investment in, in areas of infrastructural development and skill training for our youth will really help us leverage our natural and human resources for rapid inclusive growth and economic transformation. Two, simplify your processes, particularly for infrastructure projects. It is public knowledge that the processes for accessing funds within member countries of the OECD have become very cumbersome. It has gotten to the point where some OECD development institutions, for example, the World Bank and the European Commission, with substantial means that could go into infrastructure have become passive bystanders in that space in Africa. Staff of the institutions shy away from infrastructure projects for fear their restrictive and cumbersome rules cannot be met. And as a result, African countries also shy away because it takes too long and it is too frustrating to deal with them. So we turn to other sources. Despite the alarm and displeasure coming from some quarters in the OECD about this development, it is likely to continue if the OECD processes do not change. We are not unaware of the challenges regarding these alternative sources of infrastructure finance. But set against the slow and cumbersome OECD processes, and in light of our desire for rapid progress, these other sources are very attractive. A clear solution is to simplify and expedite the OECD processes while maintaining transparency. Currently, the processes for developing and financing infrastructural projects are developed by OECD institutions to reflect your concerns with little input from African countries to reflect our concerns and aspirations. Three, establish a joint Africa OECD technical committee to design procedures for processing infrastructure projects in Africa, including for public-private projects. Procedures that take into consideration the concerns of both parties. The proposed initiative will be of great benefit. My government would like to initiate the discussion on constituting the Joint Technical Committee in consultation with others, such as the African Union Commission, the OECD Development Center, the ADB, the World Bank, the Compact with Africa, and the African Center for Economic Transformation in Accra, which has been helping coordinate peer learning among the CWA countries. And four, build strategic partnerships focused on Africa's growth and transformation. This will be a win-win for African countries and members of the OECD. I'm very encouraged by Germany's Compact with Africa initiative, which should be strongly supported and emulated by all OECD countries. I'm also equally encouraged by the recent enactment by the United States Congress of the, quote, Better Utilization of Investment Leading to Development Act, the BUILD Act, unquote, 
which creates a strong and well-capitalized $60 billion United States Dollar Development Finance Institution, the United States International Development Finance Corporation, to help finance and also crowd in finance to help build prosperity in low and middle income countries. And of course, it is also to support US strategic interests. We welcome and commend this new boldness and renewed ambition in the United States to support prosperity outside her shores. And as the United Nations States Agency for International Development, USAID, puts it, quote, to build a self-reliant Africa, unquote. We look forward to working closely with them. We urge other OECD countries to follow suit and strengthen their existing efforts in this regard. A very important plank that we would expect from an Africa OECD strategic partnership for shared responsibility would be OECD's strong support to the recently launched African Continental Free Trade Area, AFCF, AFCFTA. I've already spoken of the large export market potential that prosperity in Africa would create for exports from the OECD. But that was under the assumption that the African market remains fractionalized into 54 relatively small ones with modest trade amongst them and rudimentary transport links. The CFTA will link all the 54 markets covering 1.2 billion people into a single market. It will be the world's largest free trade area outside of the World Trade Organization itself. By 2015, it will cover an estimated 2.5 billion people and have over a quarter of the world's working age population. Imagine the investment and business opportunities offered by the infrastructure required to link these markets more effectively. And imagine the business opportunities that this huge market would offer for manufacturing and service firms from OECD countries that could establish production facilities in Africa to serve the African markets. And with the accelerated growth that would result from all of these, the market opportunities for exporters from OECD countries could be truly amazing. These are opportunities worth working closely together to pursue. I hope that our OECD friends in Europe, with your own experience of the European Union and how it has helped rejuvenate it, to rejuvenate and grow your economies, will be keen on supporting us in facilitating our efforts to build the continental free trade area into an effective trading bloc and a close trading partner of the EU and the rest of the OECD group of countries. I sincerely believe that committing to and working in a new strategic partnership for shared prosperity, sparing infrastructural and private business investment, helping equip the burgeoning African youth with skills and supporting the ASCFTA to become a strong trading partner, constitute a powerful package of investments that will help scale up global prosperity and help create decent jobs for our youth and provide them the means to live dignified, productive lives. Concerted efforts are being made by African countries with the assistance of Friends of Africa to confront the scourge of terrorism in some parts of the continent usher in an era of peace and stability on the continent. A new paradigm of governance is emerging in Africa where respect for individual liberties and human rights, the rule of law and the principles of democratic accountability is shaping the evolution of African states as Africa makes bold strides to shed her post-colonial cloak of instability and join the success stories of the 21st century. Ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, I would say that the OECD and African countries have a strong mutuality of interests in working closely together in a new approach focused on generating quickly shared pro prosperity. So let's get to work. On our part, 
We're determined to take Africa where she deserves to be, an Africa beyond aid, a prosperous and dynamic member of the world community, making her own unique contribution to the growth of world civilization. I thank you for your attention. very much, Mr. President. So I would like to ask you to please remain seated because we're about to transition into our into our first session so um, allow me to uh, call on to the stage the speakers of Africa's development dynamics this session will um, look into um, how approaches are being reshaped how stakeholders are adapting to new strategies policy dialogue co-production of knowledge alliances um, are many examples of novel ways to accompany Africa's vision for continental integration. Please allow us to uh, welcome our panelists for uh, this session, Africa's Development Dynamics. Nous accueillons nos panélistes pour la session sur les dynamiques de développement de l'Afrique. Je vous rappelle que vous pouvez utiliser Twitter avec le hashtag Africa Forum ou Wisembly. Vous rentrez le, le mot-clé Africa Forum et vous pouvez participer à la discussion en ligne et les questions apparaîtront sur l'écran. J'invite notre, notre modératrice, l'ambassadrice Monica Aspé, à ouvrir le, le panel quand elle le souhaite. Merci de votre attention. Merci beaucoup, Batil. Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, as chair of the governing board of the Development Center, I welcome you to this session uh, number one on Africa's development dynamics that is aimed at setting the scene for the rest of the Africa Forum. Um, more than a, a report you've seen outside this, the Africa's development uh, dynamics, more than a report, this is really a platform for dialogue, a partnership, and um, the, the OECD Development Center supports the African Union on this report, but also to look at the integration of Africa um, in the world economy and shares lessons learned in other regions of the world. In this session, I will pose one question to each of the participants, and I will ask you to please uh, give us your reply in uh, up to seven minutes, because we're running a little bit late for good reasons, because those were excellent speeches, but we are running uh, late. Uh, so without further ado, I will now turn to the Commissioner for Economic Affairs of the African Union, Mr. Victor uh, Harrison. Um, Mr. Harrison, last March, during the 10th extraordinary session of the African Union Assembly of Heads of State and Government, African countries decided to create the African Continental Free Trade Area, which was already mentioned in the initial uh, remarks. What is behind the African Union's vision for continental integration? What can be done at the continental level to help achieve 
the transformation of African economies. Mr. Harris. Merci. À la demande de, de Monsieur Mario Pesini, ben je ferai le, mon intervention en français. Euh, effectivement, il y avait euh, cette année euh, la décision des chefs d'État et de gouvernement de, de la mise en place de la zone de libre-échange euh, continentale en Afrique. J'ai déjà donné tout à l'heure dans mon intervention des éléments, des éléments donc là va chiffrer par rapport donc à la nécessité de le mettre en place. Actuellement, on a, il y a 1 milliard de 100 millions d'habitants. Et la projection que j'ai donnée tout à l'heure, la classe moyenne serait de 1 milliard 100 millions d'habitants. C'est un marché potentiel. Mais dans l'achèvement de cette zone de libre-échange continental, il doit y avoir des mesures d'accompagnement. Qu'est-ce qui se passe en Afrique La plupart des économies africaines on produit donc des, des matières premières et des cultures de rente non transformées. Non transformées. Et c'est là la, la nécessité de faire de la transformation. Hier, j'étais dans un panel et j'étais content qu'il y avait deux individus qui m'ont approché et, et qui sont dans le secteur agricole, qui sont dans le secteur agricole et qui font déjà la transformation locale. Un euh, au Sénégal, un, un autre, donc là, je ne me souviens plus. Donc c'est l'insuscité. Parce que jusqu'à présent, l'Afrique n'est pas encore autosuffisante. On, impro, on importe par exemple 24 millions de tonnes de riz par an pour l'Afrique. Mais dans la structure de nos économies, il y a des pays voisins qui ne peuvent pas échanger dans un premier temps. C'est ça le changement de paradigme. Hein? Le Kenya ne peut pas vendre son café ou son thé au Rwanda, et vice-versa. Et donc, il faut jouer sur la solidarité et la vision commune. Donc, au niveau de l'agriculture, il y a un, 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 un département qui travaille là-dessus, sur la transformation agricole en Afrique et sur les respects des normes, il y a un département là-dessus. Et ce qui est important également comme mesure d'accompagnement, parce que mon intervention reste là sur les mesures d'accompagnement, sur les infrastructures. Nous avons un, un, un manque important d'électricité, d'énergie en Afrique. Hein, le coût de, de kilowattheure, donc c'est dans la fourchette de 5 ou bien de 9 cents de dollars, donc le, le kilowattheure, jusqu'à 25. C'est trop cher et ce n'est pas compétitif. Ce n'est pas compétitif pour les industries africaines. Si on veut faire de la, de la transformation, on a besoin d'énergie. Et donc, il y en a des projets donc, de, de, de construction de barrages, des, des projets donc, au niveau de l'Union africaine, mais il y a aussi le développement d'énergie renouvelable. Et donc, euh, il y en a déjà donc, des initiatives en Afrique de l'Ouest pour partager, vendre donc l'énergie. Le, 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 et, et après, les infrastructures. Vous voyez, si au début du siècle, il y avait, je disais ça hier, là, 100 000 kilomètres de voies ferrées opérationnelles, maintenant, il ne reste que la moitié. Hein? Et les, 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 les routes, il n'y en a que 50 000 kilomètres, tout simplement, de routes praticables pour le continent. Et donc, le coût de transport est cher, et, et, et plus cher dans le monde au niveau du continent africain. Et donc, et c'est là où je veux faire appel, parce que qui dit transformation de l'économie en Afrique, l'Afrique ne veut pas s'enfermer. Hein? L'Afrique n'est pas pour le protectionnisme. On veut le multilatéralisme. Et je fais appel donc hein, aux uns et aux autres de venir. Le, le président donc, du Ghana a dit tout à l'heure, donc là vraiment, et l'année, cette année, 
c'est l'année de la lutte contre la corruption. Nous faisons l'effort pour améliorer donc, le climat d'affaires, hein, qu'on part d'un principe gagnant-gagnant. Hein, et le, le secteur privé est le moteur du développement économique. L'État, c'est fini la limite de ce que peut faire l'État. L'État, le gouvernement, est là pour encourager les investissements. Et là, je regarde qu'il ne me reste que moins de, de, de deux minutes et je fais appel donc à ce partenariat public-privé. Et c'est là que nous allons donc nous en sortir. Il y a beaucoup d'opportunités euh, euh, en Afrique et, et là, j'arrête je, je, là. Je parlerai, par exemple, que pour les secteurs miniers, nous sommes en train de subir ce qu'on appelle le syndrome hollandais. Hein? On en a beaucoup de richesses, mais on a la pauvreté qui touche encore 35% de la population africaine. Il y a donc une vision minière africaine que l'on va développer. On est en train de, de développer les outils actuellement. Et, et j'appelle également dans l'industrie pharmaceutique, il y en a donc là vraiment les plantes médicinales en Afrique. Et donc que l'on transformera localement pour le développer. Ça donnera plus de valeur ajoutée, plus d'emplois. Et de cette manière, on, a moins, on réduira le nombre de jeunes Africains qui tentent leur vie à traverser la Méditerranée. Et je termine. Merci. Merci beaucoup, uh, Mr. Harrison. 1.2 billion people into one free trade area. Uh, that's the, the promise of it. Um, we're going now with uh, Mr. Stefano Manservisi, Director General for International Cooperation and Development in the European uh, Commission. In September, in his State of the Union address, the President of the European Commission, Jean-Claude Juncker, proposed a new alliance for sustainable investment and jobs between Europe and Africa. What are the main building blocks of this alliance and how can the EU and Africa work together to ensure that it will have a true positive impact on both African and EU economic and social agenda? Is this part of a move beyond aid cooperation and into trade investment and jobs cooperation in the sense of the speech we have just heard of the President of the Republic of uh, Ghana? Does this have to do with financing of quality infrastructure also? Well, thank you very much and thank you for this invitation and congratulations uh, uh, to the ECD Development Center and to, and to the African Union for the excellent report. Um, I say that uh, a, a lot of things have been said. I will not repeat figures again because I think that they have been clearly spelled out by uh, Secretary General Gouria, by President uh, Kufuado, by, by Victor. Uh, so therefore, all this is known. I'd like to say uh, simply uh, to recap. We, we have on one side Africa, which is, is full of good news in terms of uh, resilience, in terms of economic growth, in terms of uh, creation of jobs, in terms of uh, uh, abundance of rich uh, uh, commodities and raw materials, but we have at the same time an Africa which remains extremely marginal in terms of uh, share of international trade, extremely uh, fragile and vulnerable in terms of mobilization of domestic resources, uh, extremely let's say, on the, on the edge of uh, positive and negative in terms of demographic challenges. Uh, it remains extremely vulnerable in terms of what is the, their own internal trade, interconnection. Uh, uh, so therefore, we have an Africa which is this, uh, uh, rich of uh, present, uh, 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 let's say, outstanding results, but also a big question about the sustainability of all this with a clear, let's say, uh, vision about the fact that the, the model which has been followed so far is not enough, is not sustainable, but then also confronted to a certain, of, uh, a certain number of uh, tough decisions to be taken in order to turn that from uh, the old story to the new paradigm. This is the situation which has been described. Uh, and uh, in this, uh, there is a challenge not only of economic model, but it's a challenge of governance of this change. Because uh, uh, from this point of view, uh, the big project of uh, the Pan-African uh, free trade area is at the same time an economic project, but also a political project. 
And uh, I would say that uh, a political project, uh, the most concrete component is the awareness of uh, the necessity of a dramatic uh, wave of uh, supply-side reform and of public, sustainable public policies to be set up. Now, uh, what is the mix uh, uh, in order of governance in order to reach this? Well, I think it is the debate that in Europe we would call subsidiarity between African Union and uh, African member states. It's not an easy process. It's not something, but uh, uh, it's around this governance, uh, uh, let's say reality, that there would be the possibility to find some solution to the opportunities and to strengthen and make it sustainable. What is Europe doing uh, confronted to that? Well, first, uh, Europe uh, has uh, to realize that, uh, and we are realizing, of course, that many factors which are making at risk the sustainability of uh, Africa growth uh, are also factors of risk for ourselves. If we look at uh, the instabilities of the world, if we look at the lack of governance, if we look at uh, the increasing violation of basic rules of international law, if we look at uh, the external shocks which can be of all kinds of origin, if we are looking at the climate change as overarching, let's say, issue that uh, uh, is covering uh, all this, if we are looking at uh, the structural poverty and inequalities which is also now corroding European societies, well, we see that number of these challenges are in common. It's not only Africa. Now, third point, how, therefore, Europe is positioning in itself in respect of Africa? Well, I think that uh, uh, from this point of view, what Juncker said uh, in, uh, in, in September, uh, he spoke about an alliance. Hmm? And, and, and words matter, because it's not partnership, it's an alliance. Eh? For sustainable investment and jobs, it means, uh, let's say, a program in the making, in the making. Uh, we are not coming with a blueprint. We, we did it too often. And then we have to recover, calling about the capacity of absorption, um, ownership, etc. All these concepts should be now part of our, let's say, historical background. But all this are showing a way to do in, in unilateral. Now, ownership, not ownership, is direction given by the, the African Union and by the African member states. It's not a question of capacity of absorption or what we are doing, but it's rather how to produce together sustainable growth and jobs. So it's a real shift, a radical shift that we have to do all together. We have to do all together. Now, we are positioning with this alliance, meaning what? One, a political project. A, a political project meaning that we, we have to structure the way in which we dialogue and we take decision. We need to have a legal uh, framework to all this. This is what we are working when we speak uh, you Africa pillar of the post Cotonou. I mean, dimension. This is what we mean. Building on what we have uh, uh, done with the African Union, the joint strategy, building on what we have, we have done with the ACP, with the African states. African Union, African states. Create a new dynamic in which is creating a framework for a sustainable political and policy dialogue. Second, to develop an economic uh, vision what is keeping together Africa and Europe in order to produce better and sustainable growth for both and creating sustainable jobs for both. Is that achieved? It's not achieved. I think that on the European side, we need to develop a better analysis and vision which can think in terms of uh, your Africa economic space. We are far from this, but this is what we have to think about with our economic activity, with our companies, but with the companies and the, plant and the plants which are now under development in, uh, in Africa. Now, in order to get there, you know, on one side negotiating the, the political agreement, the binding agreement, the Euro Africa pillar, etc. On the other hand, changing our way of doing and therefore setting priority. Business environment, mobilization of domestic resources, uh, investing in skills and in jobs, I take literally what President Akufoado said, because it basically is this. And uh, investment, progressively changing our way of intervening, investment. And what we are doing is to use in this period of transition, because a period of long transition, what are the public resources, the development aid, not to be just distributed a bit as in the past, but rather to leverage private investment and to de-risk them. This is what uh, 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 we are doing this moment in which then we will arrive to something which is... And we have to do it together because then uh, there are priorities. Agribusiness, for sure. Let's see how the GDP in Africa and uh, in each uh, 
member uh, of the African Union is created, where we have to modulate this together according to sound national plan, which are not only the old development plans, but which should be inspired by the economic growth and job creation in the framework of a sustainability, because this is the challenge. What we can offer? Of course, we can offer money. Uh, in a different way. But we can offer also our experience of having built a single market, which single market is precisely the result of a governance, subsidiarity, is result of deep economic supply side and public policies, and which has been based on uh, a principle if, which has existed in our culture, European culture, well ahead of the Agenda 2030, which is leaving no one behind, because this is basically the European model. In these days, let's say, under stress, to put it mildly, because of several things. But these things, uh, migration, security, or insecurity of our societies, you know, uh, are similar to what uh, the Africans also see, but with a big difference. They are younger and younger, we are older and older. And therefore, this also matters in a relation of proximity and neighborhood that we have. Now, these are, let's say, the approach. is an approach, is something that we have to build together. I think on this, and they finish, that the, 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 the role that uh, the dialogue that we are having today and the initiative that uh, the OECD Development Center, together with the African Union and others and ourselves, uh, can play is very important. One, to keep working on reports like this. Very proud to support it and to be part uh, in the next edition. Second, to work, as, uh, as, uh, um, as Secretary General Guria said, you know, to keep working on data, on statistics in particular. Happy to already supporting this, but we have to do even more. It's not a question of supporting. It's a question of using, of living together this. Uh, knowledge is fundamental. But I would like to add uh, two other things uh, inspired by what the President Akufuado said in particular. Uh, infrastructure, make it easier. It is true. And it is true exactly the picture he made about uh, not the temptation, but the reality to go on those parts of the market uh, of other partners which are doing better. And uh, he said clearly, taking risks. Now, I think that we could, uh, uh, for example, a part, as a part of what to do next, uh, thinking about uh, on how at the OECD level we can do better in terms of fast-tracking infrastructure for job creation uh, and, uh, and growth creation. And uh, uh, building on some experience that we are doing with some partners like Japan under the name of quality infrastructure, perhaps uh, to think together on how we can set up a set of guidelines, operational principle, inspiring fa how fast-tracking uh, invest uh, OECD investment uh, uh, for quality infrastructure, job creation in Africa. This is something that we can work on this, because we need a consensus, because otherwise there is harmful competition among ourselves. We need a consensus on this. We can do it. We, we all have rules which are guarantee of transparency, but let's use this in order to do it better. First point. Second is uh, 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 something that they keep saying, and as President Kufuado said, other partners. Let's have uh, a frank discussion all together with these other partners, which are crucially important, uh, which are already crucially important, like China, like India, like others. You know. Let's use perhaps uh, the development center as a platform in which donor or not donor, DAC or not DAC, ODA definition or not ODA definition, we can discuss together about this. This is missing because then sometimes in G20, sometimes here and there, but then there is not a moment in which we share about infrastructure sustainable financially in terms of, pu of public debt, sustainable in terms of quality, in terms of resilience, sustainable in terms of who decide what. Let's maybe think, I would like to add, therefore, to the support to the next, uh, uh, let's say, uh, work on the, on the dynamics, uh, to keep supporting the data collection, particularly in statistics, I encourage to think about these two other, um, say, avenues. One, uh, a code of conduct guidelines for uh, fast-tracking uh, sustainable investment and uh, to develop a structured dialogue around on this in this place with all the other important partners because uh, time is short and challenges are big. This is what I can suggest. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, very inspiring to listen to Mr. Manservisi uh, talking about a radical shift towards an alliance between Europe and Africa and the excellent news that the EU will be joining the, uh, the next report on the uh, African, Africa's development dynamics. 
uh, work on quality and sustainable infrastructure from a point of view of the environment, from a point of view of debt sustainability and of governance, and uh, dialogue with other uh, partners, including uh, countries such as China, who are already very active, and the Development Center, of course, ready to support as a platform for dialogue. So now we go with uh, Mario Pezzini, director of the OECD Development Center and special advisor to the OECD Secretary General on Development. Uh, Mario, the, the OECD Development Center, the African Union are co-producing knowledge such as the Africa's Development uh, Dynamics, the report, this report and the Revenue Statistics in Africa publication. What is the value add of working together and the expected out outcomes of this cooperation, and I would add also in terms of this news that uh, Mr. Manservis is sharing with us. Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, a lot has already been said, so my point is just to summarize the logic that we have been following in the last year and in that we will follow in the year to come. Uh, first of all, uh, we are producing revenue statistics. You mentioned that, and we are producing them on Africa. We cover 16 countries. Now we will cover in the new edition 21 countries. I was invited by commissioner to go in Addis Ababa and present to the Minister of Economy of African countries the result of this work. Very significant result where you discover something that can be expected, but also a lot of things that are not. Uh, the, the discovery comes also from the capacity to compare what is happening in Africa, and not only with the OECD countries, but there is happening in other regions where there are developing countries, such as Latin America and uh, Southeast Asia, for example. Now, this work has already been done, it's traditional, will continue to be done, and is a basis of information. The relevance becomes from how it is used. But then come uh, the idea of this report. Uh, the report uh, that we were used to produce was the African Economic Outlook together with the African Development Bank. And there are plenty of reports of this nature in developing regions in Latin America and Southeast Asia. They are the report of economists that observes how the reality is going and then uh, provide information to policymakers that will use it or not is a traditional type of tool, and I will call it a report. What we have the ambition to produce now is not a report, it's a platform in reality. If we follow what has been said by Commissioner Harrison and by Director General Manservisi, what we need is a platform in reality. How a general process that is going to be design, uh, designed and in part is already sketched out by the words that we have heard, can be a blueprint on which different policy makers in Africa discuss, reflect, and contribute, or oppose. But at least we create a democratic space of discussion on a vision. This is not what we were used to do. And this is much more difficult. It entails different actors. First of all, the African Union. Obviously, crucial actor is the European Union, as well as what we are, we are calling in a prudent way the new actors, but obviously it's China. And let me recall that the 7th and the 8th of December, the center together with UNIDO, together with UNTAD and DRC will organize here in Paris, not in the OECD, but in Paris, a meeting on the Silk Road with China. These are crucial actors that are present. We need to create table around which we present our view and we discuss it. That's the idea for this report, to be a platform, not to be a report. And then we have heard here that there are additional important issues. It was launched by uh, the president of Ghana and, and cashed up by Director uh, General Manservisi, for example, the implementation of the work on infrastructure. What we observe, we observe that there are Ishigama principle that have been developed by the G7, Japan that intend to conduct further this discussion in the G20 now with the presidency of Japan. But the point is not only to fix principle, the point is how we implement them. And when it comes to implementation, you do need the policymaker around the table. Now it takes time. 
You may say, ah, but policymaker, uh, they don't have practices. How long did it take to us to build the institution? The OECD, the European Union, and, and the working of the Commission. How many meetings have been required in order to set standards that apply to the OECD countries, the European countries, not necessarily to the other. Therefore, this work of collective discussion and policy experience and sharing is indispensable. It's long, it's difficult, but it's democratic. That's what is required. We want to contribute to this, this exercise. And absolutely, I have noted down all the proposals made by Manservisi. We will organize table to have China, to have Brazil, to have Indonesia, to have India, to have South Africa around the table and to discuss all together how to design a way to implement, for example, the work on infrastructure. And it's true, Japan is already on board on that perspective, is very helpful in this design. This is what I think is the transformation that we are applying following the fact that there is a design, as you have heard. The good news today is that there is a clear demand to the OECD, a clear design for Africa, very, very clear point for important and crucial partners that are changing the modality of cooperation, and therefore we want to support that process. Thank you very much, uh, Mario, a, a platform to discuss and work on Africa's uh, development. Um, I want to now call to the stage Stefan Oswald, uh, Director for Sub-Saharan Africa, Germany, Federal Ministry of Development and Economic Cooperation. Uh, thank you. Um, as, a, as a key discussant, so um, through the Martian Plan with Africa and the G20 Partnership Initiative, Germany has taken a new direction in its cooperation with the countries of Africa. Yesterday, the G20 Investment Summit, German Business and the Compact with African Countries took place in Berlin. So where do we stand with regard to these plans? Well, thank you very much. I uh, would, uh, first of all, also mention uh, that I'm fully in agreement with what I heard this morning. And I think uh, the challenge is not, let's say, partly we can be better in the analysis, but what is actually still not at the point we want to have it is the implementation. And issues uh, like uh, making things happening more fast in infrastructure is, of course, understandable, but we have, of course, also to look that things are provided in high quality and in accordance to certain standards, environmental standards and so on. So Stefano, if you're just re thinking about, well, if we are lowering those standards, what, uh, let's say, our population is going to say about that. Uh, secondly, I would uh, like to congratulate, as I did already, uh, Mario, in Berlin, uh, the uh, joint work of OECD and the African Union on this very uh, concise report. And you asked me uh, about, uh, well, what is uh, the outcome of the Berlin conference yesterday? Uh, what, uh, how d does it link to the report? Well, the report states it: the continent needs to generate more quality jobs for its large labor force, particularly for women and youth. To support this, we need reform-minded forces in Africa who are striving to speed up implementation of Agenda uh, 2063. The Commissioner was already uh, referring to this. And we need more private sector in engagement because this engagement is creating jobs. And we have of course, to motivate those ones who currently are not active in Africa to clarify, let's say, what are the perspectives? Mm -hmm. If private sector is looking towards Asia, if private sector is looking within Europe or the Americas, growth potential is certainly limited. The place which has enormous potential 
is Africa, and it is going to happen, but let's say especially the European uh, private sector has to think about, well, are they part of it or are they leading the field for others? Others are more active than the Europeans. Well, uh, the ambassador already referred to uh, the Marshall Plan with Africa, which I had the honor to coordinate. And uh, directly linked to this was, of course, Germany's initiative for the G20 compact with Africa. There was already a reference made to that. Well, I think uh, the meeting yesterday showed the G20 uh, compact with Africa is working. It is, uh, we have a large uh, participation and we saw also quite a signal for motivation of private business to move into that. Reform-minded countries have not only shown the willingness, but already uh, done concrete steps to improve their fr framework conditions, the analysis of how uh, the, the compact member states are working towards uh, achieving what uh, they have uh, committed to is uh, really promising. There are quite a number of, uh, in, in the traffic light system, quite a number of uh, points where we are already in the green sector. There are another ones in the yellow where things are going on, and only very few where reforms have not yet started. So I think it is not only important to look at the foreign investors. I think it's partly a bit focused on that. It is very important to improve situations for the local private sector. First is an issue that, of course, domestic borrowing by the state is partly acting like a vacuum cleaner on the local financial market. So how should private business get access to finance if the state is taking it all? I think we have to look on, on this issue. I think also the issue of political environment and easing administrative pro uh, procedures is also very uh, is an inhibiting, inhibiting factor for uh, the uh, local market. We as development partners are challenged to maximize our support to these reforms and to do so in a catalytic way. So we are not going to do the same thing. That's the new thing about the Marshall Plan. We were also in, in very active discussions with the OECD and also with the, uh, the European Commission. Probably what one new thing came out yesterday. Our Chancellor informed uh, the audience that Germany for the next three years is willing uh, to provide a one billion investment facility uh, which uh, uh, is to benefit uh, European small and medium businesses to assist them on their way to Africa, but also uh, a facility, part of the facility is directed towards uh, small and medium uh, enterprises in Africa. And we, of course, as with the compact as such, are heartily welcoming others to join us. However, we have to be aware that reform efforts to be met by a positive market response in the, in the long term, we need also long-term uh, collective effort. And we have also to do expectation management. So if we are signing or making a commitment, having the <laughs> expectation that the first euro is rolling already three months later, that is not feasible. Well, but what, what do I mean with collective efforts to mobilize investors? We have to do more uh, fora where we bring uh, private business, high-ranking investors together with African politicians to initiate investments. There is the ADB summit, uh, uh, investment summit uh, next week in Joburg. That is a forum. But I can also say to African countries, think about a forum in your country to make things happening more quickly. I remember, for example, President Talon, he had four minutes 
to sell his country, and he did a perfect job. We very much support uh, EU Commission's proposal to launch the African-European Alliance for Sustainable Investment and Jobs, as we are anyhow quite close. <laughs> and uh, Secondly, we need a collective efforts in form of a coordinated support to the countries themselves. In implementing the Marshall Plan, Germany has decided to maximize its support to a limited number of reform-minded countries. In 2017, uh, we started uh, reform and investment partnerships with Ghana, Ivory Coast, and Tunisia in the tune of 365 a million euros additional assistance and in 2018 we have started conversations with Ethiopia, Senegal and Morocco. Everybody is of course welcome to join us in this effort. We are taking our partners and their reform seriously which also means our bilateral support is tied to reform progress. These are only six out of the 12 compact countries and I would like to encourage other bilateral development partners to look in focusing their support on the reform programs put forward by compact countries. There is space for a division of labor as much as opportunities for cooperation. How can we bring our collective efforts together in an effective way? First of all, we should use the pan-African political momentum. Stefano also already mentioned the post-Cotonou ne negotiations uh, and secondly, we need to improve the coherence of development action in African countries to achieve greatest impact. The compacts are one step into this direction. And uh, the OECD is, for example, contributing with reform support to the compact matrices in several countries, which Germany also focuses on, such as Ivory Coast, Morocco, Senegal, and Tunisia. So we are cooperating. Third, we should base our interventions on joint analysis. The report presented today and the revenue statistics are excellent examples. But also in other areas, there is potential. IFC is, for example, conducting country private sector diagnostics. We have, uh, and, and uh, ADB is doing also in-depth uh, research work. We have uh, embarked on a uh, MOU to implement uh, reform partnerships with both organizations. And finally, Mario, you, you said it is now also passed to the OECD. OECD has experience with such fora. I just recall the aid effectiveness group we had here, which I had the honor to be with, and uh, where we had also this outreach programs. You could do that in the center, but there, there is ample experience and I think it is very important to get everybody on board and also, let's say, with uh, actors like China and India, we can, of course, continue our dialogue in the G20. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, so we have a, a, blueprint, a blueprint, a platform for dialogue and cooperation. A new report is underway. Um, the OECD Development Center, the African Union, the European Commission, uh, several national governments are partnering in this uh, journey for Africa's development. And I want to thank the speakers for your participation and wish everyone a very fruitful uh, forum on Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please stay seated as we uh, thank our, our, our panelists. Uh, this concludes our, our first panel. Um, as you can see, we're running slightly late, but don't worry, we will uh, catch up. Um, we don't even need uh, impromptu interventions to remember to remind us about the timing. I think uh, speakers will uh, know um, that they need to uh, remain on time. So allow me now to uh, welcome onto the stage um, speakers for the promise of regional integration. Mesdames et messieurs, si vous voulez bien rester à vos places. Nous allons juste transitionner avec la prochaine session, les, la promesse de l'intégration régionale. Nous allons appeler les panélistes euh, sur scène, s'il vous plaît. Bonjour. 
If you can take your seats, please, we're, we're about to start. Excellence, mesdames et messieurs. Je vous prie de prendre vos places pour commencer ce panel. S'il vous plaît. Merci. Alors, beaucoup de choses ont été dites ce matin et je pense qu'il n'y a pas besoin de revenir sur les chiffres ni sur les perspectives pour le continent africain. Euh, il suffit de dire que le continent a réussi à changer quand même son narratif ces dernières années, mais qu'il lui reste beaucoup de défis pour euh, rendre euh, ou pour transformer en fait la croissance qu'il est en train de créer en une croissance inclusive, en une croissance créatrice d'emplois. Et pour ce faire, il y a un, un levier très important qui est celui de l'intégration africaine. Comme vous le savez euh, sans doute, le 21 mars dernier à Kigali, 44 pays ont signé l'accord pour, la pour la création de la zone de libre-échange continentale, ZLECAF, un, un pas important vers euh, l'intégration africaine, même si, euh, même si sur ce chemin, il euh, y a beaucoup d'écueils et il y a beaucoup d'enjeux. Alors, euh, pour commencer, je voudrais vous présenter nos chers panélistes. Nous avons avec nous M. Hachman Ferdaus qui est secrétaire d'État chargé à de, de l'investissement au sein de, du ministère de l'économie, euh, ministère du, de l'industrie, du commerce, de l'investissement et de l'économie numérique. Je vous demande de l'applaudir. J'ai oublié de préciser que c'était pour le compte du gouvernement marocain. Nous avons aussi le plaisir d'avoir avec nous M. Ibrahim Mayaki, qui est le CEO du, euh, du NEPAD, donc le New Partnership for Africa's Development. Nous avons aussi le plaisir d'avoir avec nous euh, Madame Amel Karboul, qui est CEO de the Education Outcomes Fund for Africa and Middle East. Monsieur Bonaventure Adjavor, Minister Plenipotentiary, Deputy Head, Embassy of Ghana in France. <laughs> Madame Dorothy Ngambitembo, Deputy Executive Director of uh, International Trade Center. <laughs> et enfin, Monsieur Samba Batili, qui est le fondateur et le CEO de Solectra International, ADS Group, mais aussi conseiller euh, de, du comité exécutif d'Afro Champions. Alors comme vous le savez, nous sommes assez, assez en retard sur le programme, donc on va essayer d'être précis et concis. Et je vais inviter donc nos panélistes à, à faire très court, mais condensé. Donc euh, je vais commencer par euh, Monsieur le Ministre, avec une première question sur justement le, le Royaume du Maroc, qui ces deux dernières années est revenu euh, dans les instances panafricaines. Bien sûr, la présence marocaine sur le continent 
et d'un point de vue économique est très importante depuis pas mal d'années déjà. Mais cette année, il y a eu, enfin, l'année dernière, il y a eu le retour dans les instances panafricaines à travers l'Union africaine, mais aussi la demande euh, d'adhésion à la communauté euh, de, économique d'Afrique de, de l'Ouest, CDAO. Je voudrais vous poser la question tout simplement, euh, quelle, sont, quelle est la portée de ce retour dans les instances panafricaines et quel serait le retour euh, ou les, le, le bénéfice à rechercher aussi bien pour le Maroc que pour les autres pays africains Merci. Bonjour à tous. Je suis très heureux d'être là. Euh, je vais répondre directement à la question. Euh, le Maroc a une politique multivectorielle. Euh, nous avons une, une, un vecteur euh, européen euh, d'intégration à travers le partenariat euro-méditerranéen. Nous avons un vecteur arabo-islamique vis-à-vis de notre partenariat avec les, les, les pays semblables et le GCC. Et nous avons ce vecteur africain qui est euh, encore plus important que tous les autres euh, parce que le Maroc cherche à se positionner euh, dans une géo géostratégie qui permettrait une intégration par l'investissement. Alors, qu'est-ce que j'entends par euh, intégration par investissement C'est simplement de dire que le libre commerce n'est pas un objectif en soi et que euh, euh, l'objectif final, c'est d'avoir des grands ensembles qui puissent entrer en compétition globale. Quand vous regardez aujourd'hui les trois grands ensembles dans le monde, vous avez l'ALENA, euh, où les pays euh, du Nord, euh, donc Canada et Amérique, euh, investissent euh, près de 16% de leur euh, IDE vers le Mexique. Vous avez l'ASEAN plus 3, où euh, Japon, Corée, Chine investissent jusqu'à 20% de leurs IDE vers les pays euh, euh, du sud de, de l'ASEAN, donc Philippines, Vietnam, etc. Et quand vous regardez euh, ce taux euh, pour euh, la, la, la dialectique entre l'Europe et l'Afrique, vous êtes plutôt à 3%. Donc seulement 3% des investissements européens sont dirigés vers l'Afrique. Donc là, on a un vrai problème. Parce, alors C'est soit un problème, soit une opportunité. Ça veut dire qu'on a une marge de progression d'au moins 11%. Euh, si vous faites le calcul, 11% de, de, de progression, ça ferait à peu près 60 milliards d'euros euh, d'investissement direct euh, annuel. Euh, ce sont 60 milliards d'euros qui sont fantômes, qui n'existent pas, qui devraient être là mais qui n'y sont pas. Donc il faut résoudre cette équation euh, commerciale et euh, il me semble que le Maroc a euh, cette ambition de créer un corridor économique nord-sud qui permettent justement de connecter les autoroutes de la croissance africaine avec ces marchés en, en, en forte croissance et cette dynamique euh, démographique avec les marchés matures euh, européens qui disposent de capitaux et de technologies mais pas de force de travail. Et donc c'est dans la, cette péréquation entre le, 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 le capital, la technologie d'une part et le travail d'autre part euh, que le Maroc s'inscrit. Euh, je voudrais donner un exemple. Quand vous voyez le programme de la route de la soie euh, que font les Chinois vis-à-vis -vis du continent européen, euh, c'est un peu la même chose, mais en version verticale qu'il faudrait faire. Alors, puisqu'on n'est pas capable de le faire à la place des Européens, euh, nous, les Marocains, nous faisons notre petite part très modeste du travail. Euh, vous savez, c'est la stratégie du colibri de, qui est chère à, à Pierre Rabhi. Nous faisons notre part. Et notre part, c'est un plan d'infrastructure de 7 milliards de dollars qu'on a appelé le nouveau modèle de développement des provinces du Sud. Et c'est simplement un plan d'infrastructure et de développement qui va du nord au sud du pays, de Tanger à Dakhla, pour justement connecter, ouvrir des voies express, euh, des voies de chemin de fer, des aéroports, des ports atlantiques, etc. À Layoun, vous aurez la plus grande gare routière du continent africain qui mettra les marchés d'Abidjan et de Lagos à portée de conteneurs euh, de Tangemed, du port de Tangemed qui est au nord du Maroc. Et donc voilà à peu près le, la, la stratégie et le sens de ce retour du Maroc. J'ajoute une chose, c'est que j'ai dit on a une politique multivectorielle au Maroc. C'est simplement parce que si vous demandez aux, aux gens du Golfe si les Marocains sont, sont des vrais musulmans, ils vous diront bon, c'est des musulmans, mais ils sont très 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 loin du, du, du centre. Et si vous demandez aux Africains si le, le Maroc est, est un pays africain, on vous dira oui, c'est un pays africain, mais enfin quand même, ils sont très 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 au nord quand même. Et si vous demandez aux Européens, on vous dira oui, mais le, le Maroc n'est pas un pays européen, c'est peut-être à, à peine un pays méditerranéen. Donc on est, nous ne sommes au centre d'aucune de nos aires d'appartenance et c'est ce qui fait que nous avons cette possibilité de faire une politique multivectorielle et de nous projeter un petit peu euh, euh, en fonction, de, en fonction de, des nécessités du moment et notamment, comme j'ai dit, de l'intégration par l'investissement. Euh, il me reste une minute, je vais ajouter une chose, c'est que je voudrais réagir par rapport à ce qui s'est dit dans les panels précédents. On parle toujours de l'Afrique comme si c'était un, un continent exclusivement exportateur de matières premières, euh, donc d'or, de manganèse, de pétrole, tout ce que vous voulez. Mais quand on regarde les chiffres, l'Afrique, c'est une économie essentiellement tertiaire. C'est une économie de service, l'Afrique. Donc il ne faut pas avoir ce que, ce que disait Karl Marx, le fétichisme de la marchandise. Il y a aussi les services. Et il faut qu'on y pense. 
Je vous donne un dernier, un, un dernier aspect qui, que je trouve très intéressant, c'est que vous savez que le Maroc est, est passé d'un statut de, de pays de transit migratoire à un statut de pays de résidence ou de, de destination migratoire. Donc on a euh, régularisé un peu plus de 55 000 migrants, et il me semble, essentiellement des subsahariens. Et il y a une ONG au Maroc qui a fait des études sur la sociologie de ces subsahariens qui, qui, qui transitent ou qui s'installent au Maroc. Mais figurez-vous que ces gens-là, sont, ont un niveau de formation en moyenne plus élevé que le niveau de formation des Marocains. Donc les gens qui émigrent, c'est le sel de la terre. Et donc l'Afrique la, est une économie tertiaire qui exporte un, cap, un capital humain d'excellente qualité. Et c'est là que sont les véritables opportunités. Il faut qu'on commence à les adresser. Je vous remercie. Merci. Merci beaucoup pour la précision de vos propos et surtout d'avoir respecté le timing à la seconde près. Je passe à M. Ibrahim Mayaki, enfin, à travers le NEPAD qui a un rôle majeur dans, dans la planification du développement africain. Je voudrais vous poser la question simple, peut-être trop simple. Quelles sont les caractéristiques de, de, ce, de ce modèle de développement africain Est-ce qu'il y a un modèle de développement africain euh, Merci et puis merci de m'avoir invité. Euh, premièrement, je, je n'aime pas le terme modèle. C'est la plupart des... Euh, la plupart des modèles échouent. Hein. Euh, alors, ce, ce terme modèle n'est pas véritablement dans mon, dans mon vocabulaire. Alors, point 1, euh, qui est extrêmement important et qui a été relevé euh, durant le panel euh, précédent et dans les discours, euh, le, toutes les stratégies panafricaines ont, ont un objectif, c'est lutter contre la fragmentation. C'est-à-dire 55 pays, 54, selon euh, la manière dont on le voit, euh, ne peut pas chacun avoir une stratégie de développement viable. Alors, pour faire court, ça veut dire que euh, les, les solutions euh, optimales à nos problèmes nationaux, qu'ils aillent de l'Ebola à l'énergie, euh, euh, à la malaria, à l'éducation, la stratégie optimale, la solution optimale est de niveau régional. Euh, ça, ça a pris beaucoup de temps à nos leaderships pour comprendre que euh, les solutions optimales étaient au niveau régional et pas au niveau national. Mais c'est en train d'avancer. Euh, point 2. Euh, le fait euh, de souligner euh, l'accent euh, apporté sur euh, la, les solutions régionales a, 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 a deux impacts. Euh, premièrement, un impact sur le plan de la gouvernance et, et deuxièmement, un impact sur le plan géographique. Alors, sur le plan de la gouvernance, euh, ça veut dire qu'il euh, faut les construire, ces solutions régionales. Donc, toutes les politiques nationales qui sont définies doivent être ancrées dans une stratégie régionale et, et c'est ça qui est le motto euh, de l'Union africaine et c'est ce que nous faisons en tant qu'agence de développement de l'Union africaine, c'est prendre les stratégies continentales, leur donner une dimension régionale et faire en sorte que les plans nationaux soient en cohérence le plus possible avec les stratégies régionales. Évidemment, ça, vous me direz, c'est théorique. Mais euh, c'est important de prendre ce chemin. Euh, le deuxième point qui est l'impact géographique, c'est que dans une vingtaine d'années, on ne réfléchira plus en termes de Niger, Mali, Malawi, Mozambique, on réfléchira en termes de corridors. Et, et on voit déjà ces corridors euh, prendre allure, euh, que ce soit Lagos Abidjan, euh, que ce soit le corridor central euh, du Burundi à Dar es Salaam, que ce soit le corridor Nakala entre euh, l'Afrique du Sud et le Mozambique, etc. On réfléchit de plus en plus en termes de corridors, que ce soit Lamou, Douala. Alors, pourquoi il est important de réfléchir en termes de corridor Parce que euh, ça permet de créer une densité économique plus importante et ça permet euh, de concentrer des investissements en infrastructure d'abord, euh, en agriculture ensuite, euh, en fibre optique, etc., en construction euh, et élaboration de, de systèmes de maintenance pour les rails. Réfléchir en termes de corridor change la géographie et le changement de cette géographie a un impact sur, euh, euh, évidemment, ce que sera euh, la, la, la zone de libre-échange continentale. Alors, dernier point, 
euh, il y a euh, beaucoup de réflexions sur le manque de financement concernant euh, euh, les infrastructures. Je voudrais juste donner un point. Si vous mettez ensemble tous les fonds de pension africains et euh, les, les fonds souverains, euh, leur asset de management, c'est au-delà de 2 trillions de, mille, de, de, de dollars. Euh, ces fonds-là, ils investissent moins de 1% en Afrique, spécialement dans les infrastructures. Ce qui veut dire que euh, si on, on... Et on a commencé à le faire il y a deux ans avec une vingtaine de fonds de pension et de fonds souverains. Et on, on travaille sur euh, le de-risking des projets, parce qu'ils ont besoin de projets, parce qu'il faut qu'ils protègent leurs pensionnaires. Et en travaillant sur le de-risking des projets, en travaillant sur des systèmes euh, de, de, de garantie, hein, des, des facilités, euh, ça peut les amener à investir de plus en plus dans les infrastructures. Et ce que nous privilégions avec eux, c'est les investissements dans les infrastructures dans les corridors. Et ça, c'est très concret. Et cet agenda s'appelle 5%. On veut passer de 1% de ce qu'ils investissent à 5% de leur asset center management. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup, M. Miyaki. Alors, de, de corridor en corridor, on est en train d'avancer sur cette question de l'intégration africaine. Mais enfin, au-delà de l'intégration, il, il y a la dynamique démographique, bien sûr, du, du continent qui est très importante. Alors, je vous pose la question, Amel Karboul, euh, comment faire pour transformer cette dynamique démographique en dividende démographique Je sais qu'à enfin, travers, euh, travers The Education Outcomes Fund, vous utilisez la finance dans ce sens. Vous pouvez nous donner enfin, une recette miracle pour ça Oui, j'ai voulu avoir la recette magique. Je pense très rapidement que nous savons que nous avons aujourd'hui une crise on top of a quarter of a billion children who are out of school today, around half a billion children are in school and are basically not learning. And, and if nothing changes, by 2030, half of the world's children, these are 800 million, are going to be failing to learn. And unfortunately, most of these children are in our region, are in our continent in Africa. If you, combine, if you look at the triangle, if you combine this with around 50% of the jobs are going to disappear, and in some low-income country, up to 80% of the jobs are going to disappear by 2030 or 2050 due to automatization and digitalization. And knowing that at the end of the century, there will be 4 billion Africans. If you take demography, learning crisis, and jobs disappearing, um, this could become a disaster triangle. I always say less than 6,000 days from now, one billion young African are going to enter the job market. Are these young African going to be wandering cities unemployed, looking for jobs? Or are they going to be the leaders, the activists, the innovators of Africa? And this all will depend on if we can solve the learning crisis or not. And I think this number is really important because never in human history did we have to educate as many young people as fast with so little resources. Um, never had to happen anywhere in the world in our history. So we cannot continue doing you know, business as usual. This won't work. By building more schools and hiring more teachers only, we won't be able to solve the learning crisis. So is it all doom and gloom? No. Um, I'm, I'm really honored. I mean, I have a second hat. I'm commissioner on the Education Commission under the uh, chairmanship of Gordon Brown, who is the UN envoy for global education. And I encourage everyone who wants to do policies around education to, lead, uh, to read the Learning Generation Report, uh, which we uh, published. And actually what we've done is we divided countries by income level, high income, middle income, low income, and we didn't tell Tunisia, as my country of energy, you should do the same as Finland or Ghana, you should do the same as Singapore, but we compared countries within their income levels. And what we found out is if every country moves as fast as the 25% fastest improvers, that by 2030 we will have every child not only in school but learning. So it is possible. There are four areas, performance, because pouring more money in broken systems will only you know, fund more inefficiency, so how can we cut waste? Many ideas there. The second is innovation. Um, 
I always say education is the least reformed institution of the world. If you take a doctor from 100 years ago today in a hospital, they won't be able to do anything besides killing you, maybe. But you know, if you take a teacher from 100 years ago and put them in a classroom, they probably could do most of the things. So the question is, how can we really change this? We looked at Amazonas. Uh, managed to bring 400,000 kids into secondary school by using technology without having to send teachers in every village. So we can learn a lot from, from, from other people. Inclusion, we don't only want the rich kids, and finance. And so coming to finance, this is... Um, so the Education Outcomes Fund is one of the recommendations of the Education Commission. I took the role a year ago. It felt like building the plane while flying. Um, we are um, aiming to have a $1 billion um, an outcome payment fund. Outcome payment fund means we will pay for learning. We will pay for outcomes. We are not paying for input schools and teacher salaries, etc. We're paying for children, for you know the the girl who moves from primary to secondary, stays there four years, comes out with a degree, finds employment. So it's a very innovative financing method. We are bringing investors from the capital market through a tool called Impact Bond. I'm not going to bore you with this because they are not bonds, but it's a form of a social contract between governments, donors, um, impact investors, and service providers on the ground, because we feel governments alone won't be able to do it, so we will invest and back innovative teams, um, be it in NGOs or social entrepreneurs or others, who will bring you know, catalyst systemic change by finding what works, uh, finding out the price of what works, and basically creating then uh, policies around that. Um, I would say being a Tunisian, you know, like after independence in 1956, Bourguiba, uh, our president invested 25% of Tunisia's budget in education when people protested because they said, what about roads and water? Um, I think the most important infrastructure we have are mines, educated mines. Um, and I think that Tunisia today is the only democracy that emerged from the Arab Spring, is a legacy to that bold leadership decision 60 years ago. So. For me, quality education for all in Africa is the civil rights struggle um, of our generation. It's the freedom fight that we've gonna win. Thanks. I hope so. Thanks a lot. Merci beaucoup. Maintenant, on passe à Monsieur Abjavor. Maybe, maybe I can ask you the question in English. Um, Kwame Nkrumah, the first president of Ghana, was. Uh, was a leader of African unity. And, um, and Ghana had signed the, uh, the uh, agreement on, uh, on a free, free zone trade, free trade zone. And we saw uh, Excellency uh, Nana Kufo Ado this morning was, was really engaged on, on this unity. From a Ghanaian view, how do you see African unity? How do you see this, this challenge of integration, of continental integration? Thank you very much, and uh, thank to OECD also for giving me this platform. This is a very important question, as we know. Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, our former head of state, played a very crucial role in the liberation struggle for the decolonization process. And on the eve of independence of Ghana in 1957, as you know, Ghana was the first in South Africa to be independent, he made a profound statement. The independence of Ghana is meaningless, uh, unless it is linked with the total liberation of Africa. That statement alone presupposes Africa must unite, Africa unification. <coughs> and after that, his conference with the liberation struggles, he reemphasized that statement again, Africa must unite. He evaluated the geopolitical development at the period, how Africa was partitioning the process that we went through uh, colonialism. And imagine as independent countries with fragmented countries that get independent and the rest, the best way for us to go is to unite, to have a common market, to trade among ourselves. That has been the focus at the time. But because young countries with independence, people want to hold onto their sovereignty over the years, that has not materialized as a visage. When the OAU now metamorphosed into AU, the vision changed because we have finished the process of our decolonization 
we finish the process of apartheid, all the countries are now on their, uh, on, on their feet to now look through African development. That came through the process of the AU, establishment of Nepal, the establishment of the PIDA, to lead the process of development of Africa. And regional integration has become the cornerstone of Ghana's foreign policy. All successive head of states, as you heard today, our president also re-emphasized that need of Africa unification. Because the success has been given to us already. You can't have a market space of 1.2 billion in Joko feet. If Africa should unite during that period, we will be a force to record with looking at China, looking at India, and looking at Africa. We constitute the highest as far as numbers market is concerned. Therefore, the new renewed interest for coming up with this laudable, bold initiative for continental free trade is nothing for us to joke with. We cannot continue exporting our raw materials, which will not be processed and sent back to our supermarkets to buy. We must put stop to that. If the youth that we said, the youthful population of Africa is going to be the future leaders of Africa, we need to give them that opportunity. By what? Revolutionary our industrial capacities. And the statistics has been given as to if we are to trade, how Africa will look like. I would like to concentrate for the sake of time to consider the basic things we need to do immediately. Those statistics are just projected that if we are to do A, B, C, D, we, are real, we can realize that. One, under the container free trade area, thank God there's a technical committee working on rules of origin, which is very important. If you are to have preferential trade arrangement among ourselves, there must be established rules of origin to avoid infiltration of other products outside the territory into our markets. We need to remove no tariff barriers. We need to streamline customs procedures, port handlings. We need to remove all technical barriers to trade. If we are to do that alone, Africa, intra-Africa trade can jump to over 53 to 55 percent. If we are to remove all barriers, ECOWAS now have access to uh, commercial market through continental free trade area. Uh, Eastern Africa community having access to ECOWAS market. We have the infrastructure developed. Now we are talking about 80 percent of cargo go to road transport, which is not good enough. We need to have the railway line. We need to have the efficient air system, you want to travel in Africa as a nightmare. So you have to come to Europe to reconnect. We cannot develop continental Africa uh, market by traveling to Europe before coming to Africa. Time is of essence. We need competitiveness. How do we develop our market? ICT innovations, because the youth are very, uh, uh, very active in ICT development. So we need to concentrate on these basic you know, tariff barriers cost of the trade facilitation measures to be able to clear the market across the various regional economic community so that we can have a free platform across all the regional groupings, not the limited what equals can only trade equals, EC only, EC commercial only. That will be a thing of the past. We now have an enlarged market space that we can now move freely, export our goods in a very competitive price and I bet you intra-Africa trade can hit even over 60%. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Adjavo. That's our aim. Now my question is addressed to Ms. Ngambi Tembo. And uh, there is, um, there is uh, an issue which is important. It's uh, ECMEs. How, how, can we, how can we build this African integration without excluding ECMEs? And especially if it is owned by, by women and youth. Thank you very much, moderator, and good morning. Um, perhaps I, before I get to my specific comments, I just wanted to make two general comments. One is that I come from an institution whose mandate is to work with small and medium enterprises to help them export. So my interventions will be purely from that perspective, but recognizing the very useful uh, input that has been provided by others on the panel with respect to the other areas 
that will have to be simultaneously be taken forward for us to have a very successful implementation of the uh, continental free trade area. Second point, I will not dwell so much on the, on the context because I think this morning um, our Excellency, the President of Ghana and the Secretary General and others put that into context in a very illustrative and quantitative way. So to, to go straight to the point you, you, you ask, I think we all acknowledge that the involvement of SMEs is not something that we are debating about. We know from studies that have been done that most of the economies, 90% of most of the economies are run by the SMEs. They also provide about 70% of employment. With that background, Africa is no exception. And I think the issue should be to see how we can move in a direction that we concretely make sure that we are moving in a direction where these small players in most cases can actually be able to take advantage of that opportunity. Has that opportunity been non-existent before? I don't think so. Because we have the different agreements that have been, negotiate, have been negotiated or are still being negotiated. But what we ought to be looking at is what is it that we have not done specifically to enable them to actually take advantage of what is being provided. And I think this is going to be the key challenge that we have to uh, take into due consideration in negotiating the continental free trade area. The heads of state have given us that political pronouncement. What we have to do is to run that extra mile to make sure that we transition from the political commitment to the operational aspect of it. And I think this is where the challenge is. And here, I think Bonaventure was addressing some of the issues. So what is it that we are seeing? This is an opportunity that we should not miss. It has, it, it comes once. If we lag behind and come in with interventions after this tide has passed us, we're going to miss on those opportunities. So we need to make sure that Africa together with its partners are working together to try and address the issues. So exactly what is it that we are seeing uh, needing uh, addressing to support the SMEs? Very four concrete areas that we have identified. One, it's the awareness and involvement of the SMEs from conception to implementation. I think what we have had, and here I, I speak from a perspective of having been one of the negotiators in the context of SADC and COMESA working for uh, the Zambian government then uh, where I was part of the team. It was pretty much a focus on the bigger side of the, uh, of the, of, of the, of the companies rather than looking at what would be workable for the small ones, and yet the small ones have such a critical role to play. So we will have to make sure that this is, as part of this conversation, making sure that they are aware that there is this opportunity, but also listening from them in terms of where some of the challenges are or where things are actually working. Because I think where things are working, what we need to do is to scale up. So trying to work with them collectively to get to the point where we have this uh, all these aspects being taken into account. Second is having a responsive ecosystem that takes into account the dynamics that are, are, are coming up. I think we have the traditional, uh, uh, we, we in the past I think have more or less, as somebody said earlier on, been focusing much on trade in goods, but you have the services side which we have not really maximized. But you also have new emerging areas where, which are coming on board. This is relating to the digital divide, the e-commerce the e side of things. But how do institutions that have been uh, put in place to focus mainly on providing data adjust themselves to be able to respond to very small entities or companies that are not able to understand these things on their own. Third point is the framework itself. 
unless we can offer something that is uh, the Rex Plus, somebody made reference to the Rex, I think the continental free trade area will not be adding much value. There are things that are working, but there are also things that we now need to bring on board, such as those that I have elaborated. Final point, capacity building on the product productivity side will be essential. These are small, they need that hand holding to make sure that they're actually able to produce and be able to sell something. Unless you have that transaction happening, it will not change people's lives. It, the, the agenda will not be inclusive. You will leave behind 50% of the women. You will leave behind the youth that are so critical in ensuring bringing them on board and making sure that that agenda Thanks. is one that responds to all. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Merci beaucoup. Alors, comme vous le voyez, enfin, les, les, les différentes perspectives de, de ce panel font qu'on on arrive à appréhender la question de l'intégration africaine euh, de différents points de vue qui sont très importants. Alors, euh, en Afrique, il y a une question qui est, qui est majeure aussi et qui nous aidera donc, euh, à travers M. Samba Batili. Et on, va, on va essayer d'éclairer justement ce panel en parlant d'électrification et d'énergie. Alors comment faire que, que, que cette intégration africaine que l'on souhaite euh, se, enfin, soit aussi un levier pour l'électrification et pour, euh, pour l'accès à l'énergie des Africains Merci. Euh, énergie et intégration. Je pense que le problème de l'intégration dans sa généralité, c'est d'abord une question d'état d'esprit. Parce que très longtemps, chaque pays a voulu développer des infrastructures de façon euh, interne. Et nous savons très bien que euh, on ne peut pas être compétitif et on ne peut pas continuer aussi à réfléchir seulement euh, dedans, selon en ne, pas sortant de, en, ne sorti, pas de, en ne sortant pas de nos frontières. Parce qu'aujourd'hui, euh, si on veut vraiment développer l'énergie, euh, il faut qu'on réfléchisse à un système de corridor, comme tout à l'heure M. Mayaki euh, disait. Vous prenez aujourd'hui un pays comme le Mali, euh, qui n'a pas d'accès à la mer, et qui a peu euh, de ressources euh, d'eau parce que aujourd'hui on pourrait la solution énergie au Mali on pourrait dire que bon c'est à travers l'hydroélectricité parce que aujourd'hui euh, si vous prenez le coût du fuel ça reste quand même cher donc on a des solutions de d'énergie solaire mais pour que ça soit rentable, il faut qu'on réfléchisse à, à mettre en place des systèmes de, euh, électriques unifiés. Donc, pour moi, l'Afrique, on doit réfléchir de façon régionale. On a des pays comme le Congo qui ont Inga. Inga, à lui seul, peut produire 100 000 mégawatts. Donc, ce qui serait bien, c'est de connecter, de réfléchir à connecter le continent euh, d'est en ouest, du nord au sud. Donc, ce qui nous amène dans le stade de corridor. Donc, il faut réfléchir à ce que on ait un programme unifié sur le continent. Et c'est ce que aujourd'hui nous sommes en train de faire au sein d'Afro Champion, d'unifier d'abord le secteur privé, à réfléchir, à parler de la même voie, pour qu'on puisse mettre ensemble ces programmes en partenariat avec le secteur public. Et donc, euh, moi, je pense que aujourd'hui, en termes d'énergie, si nous décidons ensemble, en tant qu'Africains, de se donner la main, de travailler ensemble, en développant des projets de corridor, on peut avoir des solutions euh, euh, d'ensemble. Inga est un cas, la Guinée, qui en Afrique de l'Ouest a beaucoup d'eau, peut servir à à intégrer l'Afrique de l'Ouest. Moi, personnellement, j'ai travaillé sur des programmes en Guinée. Nous avons aujourd'hui levé presque 2 milliards de dollars 
participe avec deux projets de barrage. Le premier barrage, c'est le barrage de Caleta. Le deuxième, qui est en construction, c'est le barrage de Swapiti, qui est pour un coût de 1,6 milliard. Et il y a quatre ans de cela, j'ai poussé aussi euh, une étude qui a contribué aujourd'hui à la mise en place d'un corridor de ligne électrique qui va relier les quatre pays. Et les travaux ont commencé et je pense que d'ici deux ans, les quatre pays vont être intégrés. Ceci a commencé avec la mise en place du barrage de Caleta qui va, qui va fournir l'énergie au Sénégal, à la Gambie, à la Guinée-Bissau et euh, à la Guinée. Donc, euh, la solution, elle est dans l'intégration euh, régionale. Ceci est valable pour l'énergie, c'est valable aussi pour euh, les, euh, le transport, c'est valable aussi pour tout ce qui est industrie. Parce que malheureusement, aujourd'hui en Afrique, euh, on ne réfléchit pas, euh, on n'a pas une approche régionale même en termes d'industrie. Euh, le Sénégal va vouloir développer une industrie tout en sachant que euh, la Côte d'Ivoire serait mieux parce qu'elle a euh, un avantage comparatif dans le domaine, je prends l'exemple de l'agriculture. Il faut que les pays africains se mettent ensemble et qu'on décide qui doit faire quoi en fonction de son avantage comparatif. Chaque pays ne peut pas tout faire et chaque pays n'a pas les mêmes avantages. Donc si nous décidons au niveau des États de faire ça, je pense qu'on aura des solutions et ce qui permettra aussi d'avoir euh, un avantage au niveau de, euh, du marché. C'est-à-dire, euh, on est aujourd'hui 1,2 milliard. Si euh, un seul pays doit produire pour tout le continent parce qu'elle a un avantage comparatif dans un domaine, ça fait qu'aujourd'hui, euh, il y a l'économie d'échelle. Et cela nous amène dans la mise en place d'une mutualisation de nos infrastructures de base. C'est-à-dire aujourd'hui, euh, si on prend le programme du PIDA, relier l'Afrique de l'Est en Ouest et du Nord au Sud. Moi, j'ai financé une étude récemment avec quelques experts. Euh, Aujourd'hui, si on veut relier euh, Djibouti à Dakar, c'est une question, on parle d'à peu près 6000 km. Et pour le, pour le réaliser, ça peut se faire dans les sept ans à venir, si on fait, la propre, on fait une propre structuration euh, financière. Et en faisant ça, on peut aussi résoudre le problème de l'énergie. Parce que ce sera un chemin de fer qui, sera, euh, qui va fonctionner avec euh, l'énergie électrique. Donc il y aura un mix énergétique au niveau avec du solaire, euh, l'hydroélectricité et même euh, de l'énergie éolienne. Donc... Euh, pour moi, la solution de nos pays, c'est dans la mutualisation de, des infrastructures à tous les niveaux. Et on le voit dans nos pays. Dans un même pays, vous pouvez être en discussion avec le ministre de l'énergie. Et ce ministre de l'énergie ne tient pas compte du fait qu'il y a un projet de fibre optique. On l'a vu, c'est un cas Juste précis. Juste un dernier mot, s'il vous plaît. Parce que okay. Il y a un cas précis, par exemple, au, en Guinée. Quand on faisait le projet de, euh, de fibre optique, le projet national euh, Backbone de fibre optique, on avait en même temps un projet de ligne électrique. Il a fallu que je suggère aux, aux deux ministres euh, est-ce qu'on ne serait pas mieux de faire passer euh, le câble de, de, de fibre optique sur la ligne qui reliait euh, Conakry à Mamou, qui est à peu près de 600 km. Ceci nous a fait gagner à peu près 65% des coûts, on a pu économiser 40 millions de dollars. Donc, c'est des exemples précis comme ça qu'il faut qu'on développe dans chaque pays pour qu'on puisse vraiment d'abord réduire les coûts et aussi euh, faciliter euh, cette intégration euh, africaine qui, à mon avis, ne se fera qu'à travers les infrastructures. Il n'y aura pas d'intégration euh, politique, 
Merci beaucoup. Sans intégration économique. Merci, Merci beaucoup, Monsieur Batili. Je sais que le sujet vous passionne <rire> et que enfin, le, le temps parti est très court, mais on est obligé de respecter le, le, le temps parti pour la session, surtout que. Alors, je vais passer tout de suite la parole à nos pundits et notamment à Monsieur Jean-Paul Moati, président directeur général de l'Institut de recherche pour le développement. Monsieur Moati, je vais pareil, je vais vous demander d'être concis, très court. Et une question. Euh, L'IRD, depuis 75 ans, son mandat principal, c'est la coopération euh, avec nos collègues de l'enseignement supérieur et de la recherche du Global South, et notamment euh, en Afrique. Et, et mon interpellation va être simple. C'est le fait que l'Afrique, aujourd'hui, ça représente à peine 2%, 2% seulement, de la production scientifique mondiale. C'est un problème auquel ni les politiques nationales ni l'aide au développement, aujourd'hui, ne donne une priorité suffisante. Alors pourquoi D'abord parce que la science universelle a désespérément besoin des progrès de la science africaine. La semaine dernière, il y avait un éditorial dans Nature, la plus grande revue scientifique du monde, qui disait « The best science of the future is sustainability science, where, where scientists co-elaborate the programs with the communities. Et ensuite, tous les exemples qui étaient donnés de cette nouvelle façon de faire de la science, c'était des exemples du Sud et notamment des exemples africains. On a besoin de cette coopération pour comprendre, par exemple, le changement climatique, les migrations, tous les problèmes qui accablent euh, actuellement euh, la planète. Et puis la deuxième raison, c'est que c'est fondamental pour le capital humain euh, et euh, pour le développement économique il se trouve que je fais partie des 15 malheureux scientifiques qui ont été mandatés par euh, la, le secrétaire général des Nations unies pour faire le premier rapport quadriennal, qui est donc prévu pour septembre 2019, d'évaluation des, euh, des objectifs du développement durable. Euh, et c'est en Afrique, notamment et même principalement, que peuvent s'élaborer les nouvelles façons de faire de l'innovation qui concilient le développement économique avec la durabilité avec les innovations frugales. Je pourrais vous donner des centaines d'exemples, y compris dans ma propre expérience, où les point of care technologies de diagnostic des maladies infectieuses que nous avons élaborées avec les collègues africains sur le terrain, aujourd'hui, elles servent à réduire les dépenses de santé dans les hôpitaux français. Donc le transfert, il est plutôt sud-nord dans cet exemple-là. Je donnerai un seul autre exemple, puisque la question de l'agriculture a, a été évoquée à plusieurs reprises. Le 4 pour 1000, cette initiative que nous développons avec les collègues africains et notamment avec le NEPAD aussi, qui consiste à faire en sorte que les sols puissent être enrichis pour mieux stocker du carbone et donc des gaz à effet de serre. C'est une contribution qui peut être majeure à la lutte contre le réchauffement climatique. Et en même temps, c'est une manière d'augmenter la productivité agricole et donc la, la croissance et, 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 et la production. Et en même temps, last but not least, de réduire l'usage des pesticides dont quasiment tous les jours sort une publication scientifique pour dénoncer les effets extrêmement néfastes pour la santé animale et la santé humaine. Et donc il faut des initiatives dans ce domaine. La Banque mondiale en a prise. Il y a eu un appel à Abidjan lors du, du sommet Union africaine, Union européenne de nos collègues scientifiques africains pour la mise en place d'un mécanisme de financement qui permettrait de faire émerger, de renforcer et surtout de pérenniser des équipes de recherche compétitives au plan africain. Et je crois vraiment que c'est un point important pour tous ces sujets, en amont de tous ces sujets qui ont été élaborés. Merci, Merci. beaucoup, M. Moati. J'appelle maintenant Marie-Chantal Ouitonze, founder and president African Diaspora Network Europe. Good morning, everybody. Um, uh, I'm representing the African Diaspora Network in Europe, which is an umbrella organization of African Diaspora Association. We aim to mobilize the diaspora for development in Africa. But given the topic, I will be speaking from another hat, which is uh, my consulting activities. So um, it has been spoken, uh, and it is a fact. Regional integration has lots of the potential for growth and development and uh, uh, for economic diversity. But the key issue now today is how do we work on components? How do we strengthen every pillar uh, 
free trade area, custom union, regulatory framework, how do we work on digital agenda, and how we make sure that we have all enabling environment uh, to uh, deliver on integration. I will focus on uh, one uh, sector that is very key, which is trans transportation. I'm sorry, my, <laughs> my, uh, my high heels stuck into... <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> So um, transportation, uh, integration is about mobility of services, mobility of people, mobility of capitals. And when you look at Africa, how many airplanes do we have? It is very difficult even to move to a country to another. I was last time in, in uh, Senegal and it was, my flight ticket was expensive more than the one I bought from Brussels to Senegal. So it is very critical. And how do we make sure that our labor force can move from a country to another? How we make sure that we have outstanding infrastructure that we enable uh, uh, investment and we enable also to work on uh, other components and the ingredient of uh, uh, free trade uh, area and integration of uh, our continent. So I, I would like to challenge the speakers here uh, uh, to elaborate more on how Africa or how your institutions, how your countries are working on enabling this environment that we're able to deliver on the bigger picture of integration in Africa. So, and I will also, uh, uh, um, come back to something that is also very Last important word. is um, on digital agenda because one of the uh, 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 one of the advantage Africa has is that we will be able to uh, uh, to array some step of development and today we're all speaking about the potential of ICT in development, but there is no single regulation, mark, uh, single regulation framework for this area. And I really would like to know if there is anyone who can elaborate on this area and what, how can we all be uh, involved, including the diaspora, to deliver on this uh, very Thank challenging. You. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Je Je, on prend le dernier point dite et après enfin, je vous donnerai la parole aux, aux panélistes pour peut-être réagir euh, aux questions. Alors j'appelle maintenant M. Amin Youssouf qui est co-founder d'Afrobytes. Bonjour à tous, merci beaucoup. Donc, euh, je me présente, Amin Youssouf, donc, euh, fondateur d'Afrobytes, une structure qui est basée à Paris, euh, plus précisément à la station F pour ceux qui connaissent ce lieu-là. Euh, notre fonction est de faire le pont entre les écosystèmes tech africains et le reste des, des écosystèmes, ça va en Europe, aux états unis en Asie, donc New York, San Francisco, Hong Kong, Londres, Paris. Et, euh, et on le fait parce qu'on essaie justement euh, d'accélérer ces écosystèmes en notamment euh, par la coopération et en emmenant, si possible, un maximum de transferts de technologies qui adressent par exemple des sujets et éducatif, comme vous l'avez dit, euh, il ne sera pas possible de construire des écoles à la vitesse où les enfants naissent, donc il va bien falloir faire autre chose. Euh, donc on amène tout ça avec des sujets comme l'intelligence, intelligence, la blockchain, etc., etc. Alors je vais aller assez rapidement pour poser ma question. Euh, je vais la poser à Samba Batili euh, et son initiative superbe, euh, Afro Champions, euh, qui consiste justement à euh, aider les gouvernements à avoir des politiques euh, qui vont justement euh, créer de l'entrepreneuriat, des jobs, etc. etc. Alors, le problème qu'on a, euh, c'est qu'on ne manque pas de problèmes à résoudre en, a, en Afrique, énergétique, éducation, etc., qui pourraient créer énormément de valeur. Et on a des entrepreneurs, et je me félicite, qui est aujourd'hui des incubateurs, des accélérateurs, qui poussent de partout, etc. Mais simplement, on bute sur un problème, c'est que nous n'avons pas de business angel. C'est clair, c'est net, c'est simple. Euh, moi, je, pour la petite histoire, j'ai vu une liste qui a été mise en, en ligne. Et voir cette liste. Et euh, les gens pouvaient euh, déclarer s'ils sont business angel. Et on avait une liste de 130, 140 personnes sur tout le continent. J'en connaissais la moitié. Et la plupart mettent des tickets entre, 50, euh, entre 5 et 50 cas. Donc autant dire que nous n'avons pas de business angel en, en Afrique. Enfin, euh, à ce stade-là, sur 54 pays, ce n'est pas possible. Donc... On veut créer des champions euh, économiques. Donc ces champions économiques vont devoir intégrer la transformation digitale, parce qu'autrement je ne vois pas comment ils vont faire face à des Google, à des Facebook, etc. Comment fait-on euh, pour créer le socle de base 
c'est-à-dire en gros des entrepreneurs digitaux, si on ne résout pas la question du financement au niveau CID. Voilà. Merci, Merci beaucoup, Monsieur Youssouf. Alors, je, je pense que je vais donner tout de suite la parole à M. Sambabatili, parce que la, la seule question qui était directement adressée à un panéliste, c'est celle-là. Merci, Youssouf. Euh, pour répondre à votre question, je vais vous dire que déjà, que nous, au niveau d'Afro Champion, on a commencé déjà à poser des actes. Euh, moi, personnellement, j'ai créé deux fonds. Un fonds qui investit dans des sociétés euh, qui ont besoin de zéros jusqu'à 50, 50, euh, 50, euh, 50 000 euros. Et ce fonds s'appelle Émergence Capital. Et nous avons co-investi aussi dans Teranga Capital au Sénégal avec euh, Orange, euh, Société Générale et puis AXA. Donc ce fonds investit dans des PME je peux vous citer plusieurs exemples de PME dans laquelle on, on a investi. Euh, une société aujourd'hui qui gère, c'est la seule société sénégalaise qui gère euh, les salons de, de l'aéroport de Dakar. Parce que c'était la seule société sénégalaise qui a eu un contrat. Nous, nous avons investi à peu près un million de dollars dans, dans cette société. Il y a aussi des sociétés, euh, des start-up de santé digitale dans laquelle nous avons investi. Il y a une société franco-africaine, euh, des Africains de la diaspora, avec des, des Français. C'est la société aujourd'hui qui est en train de déployer dans dix pays euh, au niveau de la santé digitale, c'est-à-dire ils viennent dans un village, euh, ils peuvent screener en 15 minutes une personne, les questions de santé et une fois qu'ils ont une connexion 3G, ils peuvent euh, uploader dans le, dans le cloud. Donc, plusieurs exemples comme ça. Et vous avez totalement raison, parce que moi, je l'ai toujours dit, qu'on parle d'économie numérique en Afrique. Pour moi, les trois piliers de l'économie numérique, c'est un, les infrastructures, c'est ce que nous sommes en train de faire. Aujourd'hui, j'ai participé à plus de 28 000, km, la 28 000 km de fibre optique en Afrique, euh, généralement en Afrique de l'Ouest, Sénégal 4 500 km, Mal, euh, Mali 2 000 km, euh, Guinée 4 000 km, Côte d'Ivoire 2 800 km, Burkina 2 000 km. La liste est longue. Okay? Ça, c'est au niveau infra. Il y a aussi, toujours au niveau infra, des data centers qui font partie du premier pilier. Le deuxième pilier, c'est capacity building, c'est-à-dire la formation. Euh, sur ce plan-là, nous sommes en train de mettre un, un plan en, en place. Je viens d'ailleurs de, des États-Unis, discussion avec euh, Microsoft. Nous allons mettre des programmes avec le programme Smart Africa. Nous allons commencer au Burkina en début de l'année. Des programmes de formation de masse. Euh, nous allons mettre des containers solaires avec tout un programme d'ICDL où nous allons former des millions de jeunes africains avec un programme euh, structuré financièrement euh, de façon que les États vont payer euh, au fil des, des années. Mais le programme a, a l'avantage que ça peut former des millions de personnes en trois ans. Donc euh, avec 200 ou 300 euh, facilités qu'on mettra par pays. Ça c'est au niveau capacity building. Le troisième point, ça c'est euh, au niveau de, des applications, c'est là où il y a besoin des investissements, parce qu'aujourd'hui de plus en plus de jeunes Africains créent des applications. Et ces applications ne pourront marcher que quand il y aura une bonne infrastructure et des gens formés. Parce qu'on parle souvent des applications du gouvernement. Si euh, au sein de l'administration, on ne forme pas nos fonctionnaires, pour pouvoir utiliser ces différentes applications, ça ne marchera pas. Donc, pour vous dire qu'on travaille sur les trois segments, il y a des initiatives qui sont en cours. On, a, on aura besoin d'un partenariat avec euh, tout le monde, à tous les niveaux, au niveau des États, au niveau des institutions. Et les choses sont lancées et je pense que d'ici deux, trois ans, les résultats seront là. Merci beaucoup, M. Batsidi.
Alors, je... Oui, bien sûr. Uh, very quickly, since be we are between you and your lunch. Um, just on the scientific and education side, I think there is a huge opportunity for Africa to leapfrog. Like we leapfrogged in the mobile payment, we can leapfrog in the university of the future because the education problem is not an African problem, it's a worldwide problem. And I invite you to look at, for example, the African Leadership University, um, you know, which co-founded by Fred Swanick, and one of those leaders and innovators of the future, where students in the first year don't study for a degree, they study about soft skill, project management, data analysis, etc. And you know, the coincidence that happened is at the end of that first year, after eight months, they went to do internships in big consulting firm and big industry. And you know what happened? They offered them jobs. They wanted them to stay, and they didn't even have a degree. So now, actually, with Fred, we're discussing this. That it actually, why don't we take those eight months, make of them six months, and work with the millions and hundreds of millions of African youth who have degrees and no jobs? If after those six months of you know, data analytics, project management, soft skill, they can get jobs. But then when they come back to university after year one, they don't study engineering or you know, they study around problems. Because if you do climate change, you need engineering, you need architecture, you need you know, biodiversity, you know, all these things. So, if you talk with the Harvards and Stanford of the world, and I was you know, in, in, in the summer on a program of Global University of the Future, they have such a strong legacy, they won't be able to change so fast. But in Africa, we can leapfrog, and I, I guarantee you in 10 or 15 years, the top university of the world will be in Africa where people will come to study there because we've leapfrogged the new skill and the new education and the new si way to do science. And that's our responsibility to the whole world, not just to Africa. Thanks a lot. Merci pour votre patience. <laughs> je sais que je sais qu'on a retardé le déjeuner, votre déjeuner. Euh, je remercie encore une fois tous les tous nos panélistes pour euh, leurs précieux propos. Un dernier mot alors, Monsieur Mayek, mais vraiment très très court. Oui, euh, très, très rapidement, euh, deux points. Le, le, le premier, c'est que vous prenez deux prix Nobel en économie, Stiglitz. Il vous dit qu'il faut accélérer l'industrialisation de l'Afrique pour créer les 400 millions d'emplois qu'on doit avoir dans les 30 ans. Et on ne pourra pas faire sans répliquer d'une certaine manière ce que la Chine fait. Vous prenez un deuxième prix Nobel d'économie, Amartya Sen, il dit euh, renforcer les capacités locales, renforcer le human capital development. Et c'est comme ça que vous pourrez parvenir au développement. Ce que je veux dire, c'est qu'il n'y a pas une unanimité sur un modèle. Le plus important, c'est de faire notre propre diagnostic pour avoir nos solutions à nous. Je pense qu'on ne peut pas trouver mieux comme mot de la fin. Merci encore une fois et très bon déjeuner. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président, et merci à nos intervenants. La bonne nouvelle, c'est que vous avez une heure, une heure et quart pour déjeuner. Uh, so now lunch will be served in a cafe espresso. This is outside. You can follow the signs. We will reconvene at quarter of two so that we can all be seated at two. There are side events uh, that will take place outside that you can uh, join freely. Thank you.